Welcome back, everyone, to part two and three of A Court of Mist and Fury. If you missed part one, because that took up literally an hour, this book has a lot going on. It will be linked down below as well as all of my plot breakdown videos. My name is Carrie. Thank you for being here today. As always, I'm going to pass you off to our sponsor for a quick message, and I will see you back here to start our story. Hi there, and thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Squarespace is a wonderful place to start your online presence, whether you are looking to open a shop or like me, you have a blog, carrycakes.net, you can check it out. They have so many features that make it really easy, no matter what your kind of technological skill level is. So they have a lot of different templates as far as what your actual site could look like. They have plugins that make it really easy to deal with monetization, organizing your community through comments or linking your social media media accounts. They have really great analytics as well to understand your audience and everything. So they're really wonderful. If you want to go to squarespace.com right now, you can play around with your new website for free. And then once you're ready to launch, you can go to squarespace.com slash Carrie can read for 10% off of your first website or domain. So thank you so much to Squarespace. I have been a loyal user for over four years. Um, and now I will let you get back to the video. Feyre wakes up at the night court. Reese is like, stay here forever. I don't care. This isn't part of our bargain. I'll be back at the end of the week. I have work to do. But Feyre is like, hell no, I do not want to be alone. And she asks to go with him. If you come with me, there is no going back. You will not be allowed to speak of what you see to anyone outside of my court, because if you do, people will die. My people will die. But she's down. Where are we going? Reese's smile widened to a grin. Valeris, the city of starlight. Welcome to Valeris, the city of starlight. Basically, Feyre says go, Rhysand says go, they winnow to this really beautiful house. It very much seems just like a normal townhouse kind of thing, and Feyre can feel the city buzzing around her, and cities are very rare in Prithian, in the mortal realm, so Feyre's like bugging. But they are swiftly interrupted by two shadowy figures at the front door. Two things, Feyre darling, Reese says while the figures argue loudly outside. One, no one but Moore and I are able to winnow directly into the house, and Valeris's walls have been protected and haven't been breached for over 5,000 years, so you're really safe here. He's like, you can go where you want, do what you want, see who you want, but he's like, those two guys outside might not be on the list of people you want to see. And the first voice is like, you know we can hear you, prick. And second, in regards to the two bastards at my door, it's up to you whether you want to meet them now or head upstairs like a wise person, take a nap since you're looking a little peaky, and change into city-appropriate clothing while I beat the hell out of one of them for talking to his high lord like that. She decides to go take a nap. Nuwala and Caradwen are in her room, and before she goes to sleep, as they're like kind of helping her get ready, she's like, did he say that the city hasn't been breached in over 5,000 years? years? Like, how is that possible? Nuala and Caradwen are kind of like, mm, we'd rather he tell you. And then she goes to sleep. When Feyre wakes up and comes downstairs, she has changed. Reese is ready to give her a tour of the city. And this is where we get our first description of Valeris. I do think Sarah J. Mass does a really good job in making the city seem really enticing. It's all like cobblestone streets and green copper roofs and bridges and there's a big river through the city but then there's also you look out down the hill and it opens to the sparkling sea so charming and then above the city there are these three particular mountain peaks which you have probably seen in various Aquatar paraphernalia. Feyre's like, what are those? And Reese is like, that's actually where my other house is, the House of the Wind. By the way, this is part two, House of Wind, my bad. And we will be dining there tonight, but first, a tour. So Feyre is looking at Valeris, and at first she's like, wow, this is really beautiful, but then a huge part of her is so angry. Remember, she grew up in the mortal realm, which isn't doing too hot. The Prithian that she knows is the spring court that is currently in ruins and they're slowly rebuilding each village and she's seeing a city. She asks Reese, like, why couldn't you have helped keep other parts of Prithian like this, you know? And Reese explains that 
everywhere else is known. Valeris is the only place that's been secret because his ancestors, like high lords before him, decided to keep Valeris a secret before like before this under the mountain thing was ever even cooked up right and Farah's like well when Amarantha came you didn't think to open this place as a refuge to others when Amarantha came he said his temper slipping the leash a bit I had to make some very hard choices very quickly she's pissed but like clearly Resand isn't going to talk anymore about this topic and so she asks what is it about this city that's worth saving rather than helping everyone else and Reese gives her the grand old tour it's a perfect city it's bustling it's beautiful it has all of these different little pockets to it it's got the artist corner which Feyre gravitates towards it's called the rainbow basically it's beautiful the people are happy and carefree and Feyre is pissed the fuck off is the whole vibe of the beginning of this book I wanted to scream at them wanted to pick a loose piece of cobblestone and shatter the nearest window I wanted to tell them show them what had been done to me to the rest of the world while they admired sunsets and painted and drank tea by the river easy reese murmured my people are blameless that easily my rage vanished as if it had slipped a rung of the ladder it had been steadily climbing inside of me so Feyre gets it like the people who are happy and carefree and drinking tea by the river and painting aren't to blame and clearly like reese has some pretty deep feelings about this that he's not sharing with the class right now so she just kind of puts a pin in that for later and it's time for dinner. Reese gives her the lowdown on who's coming to dinner. More will be coming, more we have already met and we love. She's the one who initially helped save Feyre from when she was being trapped in Tamlin's house. We will also be meeting Amren. Amren is a mysterious, very terrifying figure. We don't know who or what she is. She is possibly older than Prithian itself. She's not human. She's not Fey. We... Mm. Mm, she's a character, okay? For what it's worth, Reese says, I'm the most powerful High Lord in Prithian's history, and merely interrupting Amren is something I've only done once in this past century. <laughs> so, Feyre is listening, and she's waiting for the fear to hit, because <laughs> he's describing a very scary character, um, and she realizes that she's still, like, she felt rage about Valeris, but other than that, like, she really doesn't feel anything and so she's thinking like god would it just be better to be dead at this point like i feel dead inside reese reads her mind and reese is furious he is so angry that they actually do a little freaky friday thing again and they switch bodies basically and so Feyre can see outside of Reese's eyes and she sees how bad she looks and when she gets back into her head she looks at Reese and is like did you do that on purpose and Reese is just looking at her like no how did you get through my shield so that's an interesting development then she just kind of changes the subject to Valeris again gets pissed off storms off towards where they're supposed to go for dinner where she reaches a cliff and this is where they have to take off and fly to House of the Wind because you can't winnow there. Vera is just like, nope, leave me here to die. I would rather climb. There are stairs, but it's something like it would take her like two days. All right, dinner would be over. She says, the wind will rip this gown right off. Reese's grin became feline. This book is where Sarah J. Maas doesn't hold back um, with everything is turning everybody on all right so i'm not not putting them all in there but just know that like everything that everyone says is twisted into a slightly sexual way all right it's charming anyway he convinces her to fly in picks her up and assures her that if she doesn't want to work with them she just has to say one word and they'll bounce right back to the townhouse because this is the meeting where she's gonna meet the team and decide if she will work with them on this whole highburn thing. We shoot into the sky as fast as a shooting star. Oh boy, are we gonna get a lot of flying scenes. Basically, I mean, you know, you know, you know. <laughs> now they're at the top of the mountain, right? And she's looking down at this city that is just massive. It just spreads as far as she can see, all these glittering lights, and then just the emptiness of the sea. And she's just really hit by how big the world is. And she get, clearly gets this like moody look on her face. And Reese is kind of like, what's going on in that big brain, Feyre? I'm thinking that I must have been a fool in love to allow myself to be shown so little of the spring court. And maybe I would have lived in ignorance forever like some pet. I'm thinking that I was a lonely, hopeless person. And I might have fallen in love with the first thing that showed me a hint of kindness and safety. And I'm thinking that maybe he knew that. 
maybe not actively, but maybe he wanted to be that person for someone. And maybe that worked for who I was before. And maybe it doesn't work for who, what I am now. And Reese is like, whoa, like let's put a pin in that, but we've got to meet the boys. <laughs> so Reese and Feyre have been having this conversation on the balcony of the House of Wind, right? And there are two shadowy figures whose voices sound familiar. And this is where we meet Cassian and Azrael. I forgot to mention this, but when he was explaining who was going to be here, Amren is his second in command, followed by Mor, and Kazian and Azriel are like the low tier of the inner circle, is what he calls his friends. And so these two boys are dripping in leather, and they're quite playful. One of them is like, come on, Feyre, we don't bite unless you ask. And Feyre is kind of like, okay. And so she approaches. Azriel is Rhysand's spy master. He is incredibly beautiful, quiet, seems like a little tortured soul. He's a very interesting character. We also have Cassian. I'm obnoxious. And he is head of Rhysand's armies, plural. They are both Illyrian. So Illyrians are a group of warrior people who live within the night court and they are all winged people. They aren't high fae, okay? We'll get more into the story, but like they go way back. They're the bat boys, <laughs> okay? So Reese just did the introduction, right? Telling us what everybody does. And Azriel is like, Cassian is also in charge of pissing everyone off. So good luck, Feyre. To prove his point, Cassian immediately jumps into the conversation to ask Feyre about the worm. He's like, girl, how'd you do it? I heard. That's amazing. And so Feyre gets confirmation of what she suspected, which is that the inner circle were not under the mountain. Remember, she already kind of asked more about this and Reese interrupted and was like, shut up, more, shut up. Cassian and Azriel were not under the mountain either. She's going to assume Amran wasn't as well. Feyre makes some kind of joke back um, and Reese is watching her like a hawk because this is the day that she's gonna decide if she wants to work with them. So like every interaction, even though it seems like it's just kind of fun, um, Reese is sitting there like on the edge of his seat like, please like them, please like them. This is when Moore comes out to the balcony to save Feyre. She's like, these boys have no manners. They should have invited you inside. Come on in. And inside awaits Amren. Amren comes a little closer to Feyre, looks her straight in the eye, and is basically like, oh, so there's two of us now. And Feyre's like, oh? <laughs> and Amren's like, we who were born something else and found ourselves trapped in strange new bodies. So whatever it is, you know that this isn't what she looks like normally, okay? And this is where we first really see the word made with a capital M. Feyre was made into a high fey by the High Lords. Amran was made into whatever the hell she is now by something else. You're gonna see made a lot. This is also where we get the strong sense of found family. I actually kind of like the dynamics. It gets a little old, but if you listened to my Crescent City video or you read Crescent City, it's very similar to that. They seem pretty immature, um, but they're also like siblings and they hate each other. There's weird tension that we're going to explore, but overall, it's a good feeling. It's very casual. Throughout the book, we piece together all of their kind of family backgrounds and basically all of them have had bad family issues. And so um, Feyre as well feels really at home here, but she also feels a little bit overwhelmed because they talk about a mile a minute. Lucian would love them we'll get into it. So another important thing that we learned from this dinner is that Feyre just straight up asks like, all right, so what were y'all doing when we weren't under the mountain? And everybody kind of looks a little uncomfortable. Moore basically says that, you know, none of us were there and Reese managed to keep Valaris safe from Amarantha. And then everybody just kind of lulls into this silence. And Feyre comes to this realization that Reese hadn't expected to see them again when he'd been dragged under the mountain, yet he'd kept, kept them safe somehow and it killed them the four people at this table. It killed them all what he had done, however he had done it. And more after this like very heavy silence, basically with tears in her eyes is like, there's not a single person in Valeris who doesn't know the sacrifices that happened, like what happened outside, like they all know. Feyre changes the subject because she realizes that she 
ruined the vibes and she notices that even that momentary talk of under the mountain kind of winked that little twinkle out of Rhysand's eyes because he was so happy to be with his friends, right? Speaking of Rhysand, we get a little bit more info about him and his mother. Like we said, his mother is Illyrian, which is what Cassian and Azrael are. His father was the High Lord and apparently his father was like at one of the Illyrian war camps and just randomly saw his mom and the mating bond slid into place. His mother was just like a caring, wonderful person. Like Reese can't say anything bad about her. He absolutely loved her. His father, for as great as his mother was, um, his father was horrible, which we'll touch on in a second. But if you're wondering how the inner circle was born, she wanted Reese to get the experience of being Illyrian. So she sent him to the Illyrian war camps to train. And since he was like a half-blood, he ended up meeting Cassian and Azrael because they were also kind of outcasted. And that's kind of how the inner circle was born. But if you're wondering, how do all these nice people with this beautiful city get this reputation of being such a horrible court like everyone is so scared of the night court right how did that happen Rhysand's dad actually was kind of a shitty guy and he kind of ran his court in a very horrible way when Rhysand's dad died Reese split up the court he had actually Moore's dad stay over there and like keep up the act Reese was basically like just stay there and be evil do your thing. We'll be over here being nice. So there is actually an evil night court and they call that the court of nightmares. And what do we call this court that we are sitting in right now? Cassian, what is it? The court of dreams. It's only fair that Feyre also gives them a rundown of her life. Cassian is very impressed that she taught herself how to hunt. So you know how to hunt, but do you know how to fight? When Feyre says no, Cassian's like, well, lucky for you, you just found yourself a teacher. And at first Feyre was gonna be like, thanks, but no thanks. But then she's like, actually, I do wanna know how to fight. But then she remembers Tamlin and Lucian's words, which were, if she trains the other High Lords are gonna get mad. So she kind of asks that to the room. She's like, but won't that send a bad message to the other High Lords? The moment the words were out, I realized the stupidity of them. The stupidity of what had been shoved down my throat these past few months. More pretty much gets exactly where she's coming from. I once lived in a place where the opinions of others mattered. It suffocated me and nearly broke me. With enough courage, you can say to hell with the reputation. You do what you love and what you need. And that's the moment when Feyre's kind of like, Damn, I've never had a female friend before. I like more. And she kind of realizes that Reese was really smart to bring her to this dinner because these are the exact kind of people she would love to be surrounded by. Like people who challenge her and don't coddle her. She turns to Reese and says, I accept your offer to work. Um, I will earn my keep and I will help you with Highburn in whatever way I can. And Reese is just like, that's great to hear. Everybody else at the table is sitting there like, uh, because they were not told that this was basically like an interview. <laughs> they passed the test without knowing they were taking it, so I'm happy for them. And they immediately start planning. The inner circle wastes no time. And so remember, Reese has a lot of information that he couldn't tell Feyre until she agreed to work, so we're gonna get a tiny bit of an info dump. The Atter, where are you, buddy? The Atter escaped from under the mountain. He didn't get killed when everybody else did. So now he is off working for Highburn. Highburn has a plan. Excuse me. This is the king of Highburn, all right? He wants to take over the mortal realms again, right? And first thing he has to do is take over Prithian. He is going to resurrect Jurian. Remember how Amarantha had Jurian's eyeball as jewelry? The adder took Amarantha's ring and so now Highburn has a piece of Jurian and they think they can find a way to resurrect him. Resurrecting a man in any way, shape, or form is a bad thing, so they aren't sure if that's even possible to resurrect Jurian, so their first order of business, they are going to go to the prison, capital P, to see the bone carver. Everyone hates this idea. When Reese says that, they're just like, there's gotta be another way. And they get even more pissed when Reese is like, yeah, Feyre and I are gonna be the ones going. <laughs> and everyone is like, oh my God, no. Feyre's just sitting there. All of this is gibberish to her, like, okay. Amrin is actually the only one who is like, yeah, that might 
actually work? Feyre is just like, how bad can it be? Like, why are you guys freaking out? And Cassian just says, bad. None of them bothered to contradict him. So dinner is over and they're going to head home, but not before Feyre gets a chance to talk to Reese again. And I think that this is important. She's still really not letting go of this whole Valeris exists when everything else went to shit thing. She's basically just like, damn, you really did that. Like you really kept all of those people safe. And he says, I love my people and my family. Do not think I wouldn't become a monster just to keep them protected. Basically, when Amarantha tricked him out of his powers, like she did with all of the High Lords, he had just enough power left to shield Valeris. He also had enough power left because he's the most powerful High Lord in Perthian history. So his like little drop of power is actually a lot. He also was able to control anybody who was in the night court under the mountain he was actively controlling their minds every second of every day of every decade to forget about the city to forget about the inner circle he only had enough power for one city i chose the one that had been hidden from history already i chose and now i must live with the consequences of knowing that there were more left outside who suffered and Feyre says it's a shame that others in prithian don't know what a shame that you let them think the worst and reese says as long as the people who matter most know the truth, I don't care about the rest. Get some sleep. I wish I could tell you that now Feyre doesn't have any nightmares, but they still continue. She does go to sleep, but she is awoken with someone shaking her, screaming her name. She was having an absolutely horrible nightmare, and I guess while she was sleeping, her wolverine claws came back out as well as flames remember how she burnt the table that one time apparently she like was setting her bed on fire and like shredding her sheets resand obviously felt it through the bond and so he ran and came to help and he's like vera vera wake up oh my god he's like scanning her face and she finally looks around and like realizes what she's done reese kind of pushes her hair back and is just like breathe imagine winking them out like candles because her fingers are on fire so he's like just just like blow them out you know she gets a handle of it goes to the bathroom throws up as usual as she is sitting there head in the toilet breathing trying to calm down resand kind of tells her about his nightmares too because he always has nightmares about under the mountain and he just kind of keeps talking to her to help her calm down and she eventually somehow passes out in the bathroom and she wakes up the next morning in bed with fresh clean sheets okay like i said the inner circle doesn't waste any time so the next day we're heading to the prison reese shows up dripping in leather he's got knives strapped to every inch of his body and Feyre is like what did i get myself into they winnow to the kind of western isles off the coast of the night court and reese is kind of like just a heads up uh the people in this prison are creatures that are older than prithian itself pretty much the nastiest of the nasty right he also lets favor know the reason why when they were talking about this last night the reason why the inner circle no one suggested omran go is because omran was a prisoner there more info on that later maybe they start walking towards the prison and she realizes it's like this giant rock island thing and the prison is under the rock it's like in the ground Feyre suddenly realizes like oh my god I'm gonna have to go into this enclosed space this space that was built to keep people inside and she has another panic attack she really wants to help but she's like I'm so sorry, I can't do it. Pretty much no questions asked, Reese just grabs her and they winnow right back home. Feyre pretty much stays in bed the whole rest of the day, feeling like she just failed her first job, right? And so she's like coming down from her panic attack, feeling pretty shitty when Amren, speak of the devil, walks into her room. Creepy as shit, all right? Feyre doesn't even hear her come in <laughs> kind of thing. Amren is just suddenly at her bedside holding a necklace and is like, hair. <laughs> I didn't quite go over this, but Amren's thing is that she really loves jewelry to the point where Resand, whenever he sees her, always has bought her a new shiny thing just to like keep her in a good mood. You know, don't touch her jewelry, she will kill you. So she hands this necklace over to Feyre and she's like, this helped get me out of prison. It's like an amulet. 
She's like, this is what helped get me out of prison. Wear it when you visit and you won't be able to get caught there. You'll always get out. But if you don't give me this amulet back, I will skin you alive or something along those lines, right? And so kind of with shaking hands, Feyre accepts the gift. And to her credit, she hops right back on that horse and the next day she's like, all right, let's do this thing. And she's wearing her amulet. They head to the prison. Reese keeps looking at her amulet like, what the fuck is she wearing? And in they go. So they walk into the prison and it's literally just a tunnel straight into the rock. And then it's just silence and silence. There were no doors, no lights, no sound, not even a trickle of water, but I could feel them. I could feel them sleeping, pacing, running hands and claws over the other side of the walls. And they were ancient and cruel in a way I've never known, not even with Amarantha. They were infinite and patient and had learned the language of darkness. That literally doesn't matter to the story at all. I just wanted to read that. Feyre's just looking to fill the silence, so she's kind of like, Hey, Reese, speaking of Amran, how old is she? Reese is like, actually, Asriel did some digging, and she was in the prison at least a thousand years ago, so we don't really ask Amran questions, Feyre. She seems to be the only one of her kind, and there's no record of others ever having existed. There are legends of rips in the fabric of the realm, and so maybe she's from another dimension. I'm gonna subtly plug my Crescent City videos. Anyway, she's very rare and they've been looking for a way to send her home for a very long time, but that's all we get on Amarin right now. But they are here to visit the Bone Carver. The name the Bone Carver, I can only picture the goblin from the 10th Kingdom. What are you in for? Carving. Will you be my friend? But the Akotar bone carver actually takes the form of a different thing for each person. So Feyre and Reese could both be looking at him and he's two different things, right? Feyre sees this cute little boy, this adolescent, <laughs> and he is immediately interested in Feyre. This is why they brought Feyre to talk to the bone carver is because he is like, it has been so long since I've seen something like you, something fresh, something made, I love it. And he's really obsessed with death. So like Pharaoh walks into the cell and immediately he's like, I heard that you died. What did you see after you died? But luckily Reese and Pharaoh have practiced and they know that everything in Fae is a bargain. And so Reese was hoping that the bone carver would be interested in Feyre. And so now they're gonna do some information trading, right? So Feyre's like, I'll answer your question if you answer one of mine, smarty girl. Feyre is like, I heard a crack when she broke my neck and then it was dark, but there was a thread and I yanked on it and suddenly I didn't see through my eyes, but through his and she nudges Reese. And I knew I was dead and this tiny scrap of my spirit was all that was left in me, clinging to our thread of the bargain. And then the bone carver is like, did you see anything beyond? And Pharaoh was like, honestly, no. And Feyre's like, there was only the bond in the darkness. Reese's face had gone pale, his mouth in a tight line. And then the bone carver is like, were you afraid? And she's like, hmm, felt like the scary part already happened. You know, I broke my neck and this crazy lady was screaming at me, right? Throwing me around the room. <laughs> Finally, the bone carver's just like, so in other words, there's nothing after. And Feyre's just kind of like, it was only peace and darkness, you know? So now it's Feyre's turn to ask the questions and the bone carver just asked her a ton. So she has a few that she can ask him. Her first question is basically like, if there were to be a tiny piece of a person, like let's say an eyeball, could you resurrect them? And the bone carver is like, uh, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but there was the cauldron. And so if you remember vaguely throughout this book, we have seen images of the cauldron. And then instead of saying like, oh my God, they always say like, by the cauldron, you know? So it's like this mythical thing that has like huge magical powers that can bestow magical powers on other things, okay? It was apparently very wicked. And so somebody got it and hid it. And he's like, I knew where it was, but then it vanished from that hiding place. So I don't really know where it is. And that's all the information I can give you. And so they start to leave and Feyre suddenly turns back. She says, you know, when I was dying, I actually had a choice. I knew I could drift away if I wanted to, but I chose to hold on a little bit longer. If I had faded, maybe it was a new world, but I wasn't ready for it. It did feel like there was something else waiting there, 
something good. And the bone carver's like leaning in, but she's not done. The bone carver always wants secrets. Like a question for a question, okay. But if you want like a real juicy answer, you gotta give him a secret. She's like, if the third fairy hadn't been Tamlin, I would have put the dagger in my own heart. I dare to glance at Reese, and there was something like devastation on his beautiful face. It was gone in a blink. The bone carver seemed to like that secret and he has one of his own. The cauldron that I just talked about, yeah, you can raise the dead, but you can also do a ton of other things like shattering the wall between the mortal and the fey realms, AKA the only thing keeping the human safe from highburn. The only way to stop that from happening is this thing called the Book of Breathing. And it shows you how to stop the cauldron's power and or control it. It was split into two because the book is too powerful. One went to Fae and one went to the mortal queens, okay? So actually the Summer Lord, for some reason, <laughs> has it somewhere. I don't know why they chose to give it to him, but there it is. If you potentially were to get the book back together, that's how you control the cauldron. Have a nice day. Lovely meeting you, Feyre. You want to talk about death anytime? You're welcome back here. And they leave. And we've got our next step. We're back home and we're updating the inner circle with what we have learned. And it seems like Reese actually kind of already knew most of this stuff. He just wanted a confirmation. This is why the book is 700 pages. Reese always has to check his work. So they are planning to go to the summer court to steal that half of the book. And this is where Reese's obsession with Feyre's hunting skills really comes into play. Remember, when he was recruiting her for this team, he was like, you have something that I need, and it's this particular power you have. His theory is that because she has a little drop of power from each High Lord, she might be able to trace their, like, magical footprint and find a certain object. Does that make sense? So like because the Summer Lord took this book and hid it, he might have left like a trace on it. And so if she goes to the Summer Court and like sniffs around, it might call to her because she has a piece of him in her, you know? Uh, it's, mm. so anyway, but Reese is like, I'm not gonna bring you to the summer court and have you just like sniff around and us realize that your power doesn't actually work. So I'm gonna put you to a little test beforehand because I have something very special that was taken from me and I want it back and you're gonna get it. And Moore is just at the table just like, oh shit. They are bringing Feyre to the Weaver. We don't know what the Weaver is, who the weaver is, but the inner circle seems more scared of the weaver than the bone carver. And Reese is like, yeah, you know, you just gotta get this thing back. We're just gonna visit her. Easy stuff. The whole inner circle is like, Reese, you can't. She's wicked. She's evil. But Reese just kind of brushes it off and Feyre seems game. He's like, okay, so tomorrow we'll go see the weaver. And uh, when Feyre completes her task, we will then bring Highburn to its knees. Feyre goes to sleep and the sun is barely up when Reese storms in and is like, all right, time to go. And she's like, do we really need to rush? Like you guys are really just like, go, 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 go. And Reese is like, remember when I asked you to work with me two months ago? Yeah, if you had agreed back then, we wouldn't be rushing, but here we are. So let's get to work. This is when Feyre realizes that he has known all of this stuff. Like I said, he knew about the summer court thing. He just went to the bone carver to do his homework. And she's thinking about all the things that he has done for her, building up her mental shield, teaching her to read. All of that plays into his plan. She needs to find the book. What use is she if she finds the book and she can't fucking read, okay? So he taught her to read. You get it? He's always a couple steps ahead, right? And Feyre's a little pissed, but she's basically like, okay, I get why you did all that and you couldn't tell me because I didn't agree to work with you, but I need to be told of all future schemes. And he's like, okay, sure, but like, get dressed, don't bring any weapons. <clears throat> Feyre's like, did I not understand the vibe last night? It seemed like everybody was really fucking scared of the Weaver and you're telling me to not bring a weapon. You went to see the Bone Carver covered in knives, my dude. Explicame. Like, what? He's like, okay, you can bring a knife. Only because she, the weaver, has knives in her house already. But if you bring anything else that isn't supposed to be in her house, she will immediately notice, and that is bad. And Feyre's like, I'm not supposed to be in her house. And Reese is like, that's why you're gonna be fast. <laughs> 
He's like, don't make a sound, don't touch anything except for the object she took from me. He's like, if our hunch is correct, you and the object will have some kind of imprint and because she has a bit of Reese's power and she's going to retrieve Reese's object, the weaver's alarm bells won't ring again. Mm, not super tight, not super tight. And he's like, if you touch anything else, you'll be in trouble. And this is where we learn the weaver is blind, but all of her other senses are like insane. So he's like, clock's ticking, Feyre, in and out. <laughs> Now it's time to test your memory. Remember in my first video when I told you that Sarah J Maas loves to break tension by using like sexy time or vice versa, like she'll break sexual tension with like a horrific thing or she will break horrific dark emotions with sexy time, okay? So Feyre is nervous, I would say. She's walking into a place where she will probably be killed, doesn't know what she's looking for, like they have no idea whether her skills actually work and she's just holding like a fucking butter knife, all right? Reese notices and he just starts making all these weird ass sexual jokes. She, he's like on the border of pissing her off and turning her on, you know? Okay, you get the vibe. And Feyre realizes what Reese is doing. She knows that he is distracting her and she also knows that it works. She is no longer quite so nervous because she's so focused on being angry and being a little horny. So that's great. Then they see this cute little fairy tale cottage. It's quaint. It's got a little thatch roof. Looks inviting. Maybe it's made of candy. And Reese is like, all right, I'll be out here. Good luck. And just kind of disappears. <laughs> Feyre opens the cottage door and walks in. Luckily, the door doesn't squeak. And she hears this like super ancient voice singing a creepy child lullaby. And turns out the weaver is a hoarder, okay? She looks around the cottage and it is stuffed to the gills. The weaver, by the way, is sitting over at her table at her spinning wheel, weaving something into thread. Feyre gets the distinct feeling that whatever she is weaving is not from a sheep. She's sort of like, I really, I don't even wanna know. I'm not even gonna linger on that thought, okay? She's running through the house at this point, not getting any vibes other than the fact that like this is creepy and I don't want to be here. She's trying to be quiet, running around thinking that she's a failure, okay? And then she feels like a tap on her shoulder and she pivots and she feels a little tug and something is calling to her. She climbs up this shelf and she finds what's calling her and it's this ring and it has the distinct scent of re-sand, which I know you're curious, it's salt and citrus. <laughs> She's left the door open, by the way, because she's not dumb. So she checks, like, how far is the door from her? Can she jump? You know, how many steps is it going to take her to run once she picks up this ring? She grabs the ring, is about to jump down from the shelf when she realizes the weaver has stopped singing. Feyre lunges for the door. The weaver's not having it, slams the door immediately, and is like, who's in my house? She just starts getting chased around this crazy house. Stuff is falling from the shelves. No longer need to be quiet, okay? Eventually, Feyre realizes the only way out is through the fireplace. So she jumps into the fireplace, starts crawling up the chimney, and realizes it's a quite tight fit, and she gets stuck. The weaver starts climbing up after her, and Feyre is like, this is it. She starts having another panic attack. She's like, this is where I die and she's enclosed in a small space like it's everything that she hates there's no escape she starts just like hallucinating and there's a voice in her head and it's not resand haha <laughs> it's actually Feyre's own voice <laughs> she's got so many voices in her head Feyre some little part of her is like get a hold of yourself, girl. We've got this. You've got to breathe. Look for a way out. You're not done yet. Feyre kind of calms herself down enough to realize that some of the bricks in the chimney are kind of loose. She just starts slamming her fist into the walls of the chimney. Eventually, a brick comes loose and without hesitation, she just sends it down the chimney, slams it right into the weaver's face, probably breaks her nose, and she starts pushing herself up the chimney. She's like, I've survived so many fucking horrible things. I'm not ending this now. Not for a ring. And up she climbs. She doesn't stop climbing until she gets out onto the roof. The roof, by the way, that cute little thatched roof, it's not straw, it's hair human hair and that chimney as she was climbing she's like ew it's so slippery because chimneys you know if you're cooking food 
it gets like grease and stuff. Yeah, that fat didn't come from a pig. She's also got like clumps of hair and skin stuck to her. So she's like, oh my god, I have boiled human fat all over me. I'm about to throw up, but she doesn't get the chance to because the weaver busts out of the house. She can't find Reese. Reese is supposed to be nearby and um, nothing. Radio silence from our boy Reese. So she's running around the woods. Eventually, Reese finally pops out and is like, what did you do? I skidded to a stop, breathing raw. I thought my lungs may actually be bleeding. You! I hissed but he raised a finger to his lips and winnowed me, grabbing me by the waist as he spirited us away to the house of the wind. <laughs> so she's just like, Rawr! she is like next level angry. When they finally get home, Feyre is finally able to vomit. She explains what happened and she's like, yeah, the second I touched it, she detected me. So thanks for that, Reese. And by the way, where were you? And he was like, Meh. I figured you'd figure it out, you know, I wasn't too worried. And Feyre realizes that this was a two-part test. It doesn't matter if Feyre can find shit, all right? That's a cool party trick. But if she continues to have panic attacks whenever she's in a tight spot, she's useless as like a spy, warrior, whatever the fuck she's supposed to be. So Rhysand was checking number one, can she find the thing? And number two, can she get over her panic attacks and survive this ordeal? But she's like, weren't we just talking about how I need to know all of your weird ass schemes? Like, can you just tell me what the plan is? Like, my dude. And even Cassian is like, whoa, you know, that was pretty rough even for you, Reese. Like, damn. Feyre is straight up like, Cassian, I need you to teach me how to fight. She's like, I'm not doing this running away thing ever again. I want to know how to fight my way out. And then she's like, Reese, you know, are you happy? Did I do a good job? Can I get a pat on the head? You know, he merely picked up the ring and gave me a nod of thanks. It was my mother's ring, as if that were an explanation. How did you lose it? I asked. I didn't. My mother gave it to me as a keepsake, then took it back when I reached maturity and gave it to the weaver for safekeeping. Why? So I wouldn't waste it? Reese is being all vague. You know it's gonna come into play later in the book, so I'm not gonna tell you. But Feyre is like, I need a bath. So I'm gonna leave. She's about to get in the bath when Reese like comes in and Reese is like, hold up, let's test some of your powers and Feyre's like honestly I really need to get this like boiled human off of me so can we not and he's just kind of like hmm okay but then he says I'm really surprised that Ianth didn't cut you up to see what's under your skin while you were at the spring court and Feyre's like okay you and Lucian both have it out for Ianth like what's what's wrong with her why are you guys so upset with her and he's like okay let me show you a little memory I've got. And he actually lets Feyre into his brain. What we see is essentially sexual assault. Ianth is trying to seduce Rhysand. He's been turning her down. So she just like shows up naked and is like, listen, high priestess, high lord, our offspring would be so powerful, whatever. You know, she's a social climber. She wants to be like queen of the queen. I'm not gonna go too into detail, but like she attempts to assault Rhysand. Feyre is like, oh my God, this is exactly what she's been doing to Lucian. Like she's been acting that exact same way with Lucian. And that kind of gets her thinking about the spring court and how happy she is to not be there anymore. Like with Ianth, who she now has a totally different view of and all this stuff. Rhysand kind of leaves her to it, not before being like, by the way, rookie mistake, uh, I let you into my brain, but just next time somebody does that, you know, make sure you have a back door because I could have trapped you in there, honey, you know? He doesn't always tell her all the rules of the powers, which I find so annoying. But anyway, she gets to take her bath, rinses all that ick off of her. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to be heading back to the human realm because if you remember, the bone carver told us one half of the book is in the summer court and we're waiting to hear back from the high lord. We asked if we could go visit his house and the other half is with the mortal queens who live on the mortal continent, right? But they have decided the only way to safely meet with them or to even request a visit is to use Feyre's house. So yes, they fly to Feyre's family home. Reese is going to carry her, but then she gets this flash vision of his hands on her thighs, and she decides it's safer to have Asriel take her. 
uh, it begins. So anyway, they land in the mortal realm. Feyre is like, listen, we haven't told them. Like, we're just dropping in on her family, right? She's like, let me talk to them first. We don't need the Bat Boys right now. Why don't you guys go, like, stand over there? Because it is Cassian, Resand, and Azriel who are joining us today. And Feyre just knocks on the door. The housekeeper, whoever opens the door, um, is, like, not super pleased to see her. But eventually, she gets to Elaine and Nesta. Their dad is off doing merchant work elsewhere. He's been gone for a while. Elaine is like crying, sobbing, so happy to see Feyre. They thought that she died. Nesta is like, what the fuck, Feyre? Told you not to come back here, and now you come back here, and you're a fairy? Like, can you... Ugh. She gives them the lowdown about what happened. She's basically like, yeah, I sort of died. <laughs> More on that later, but so I'm a fae now, and Highburn is planning to invade the mortal realm, and we're all gonna die, so I brought some fairy boys with me, and we would like to write a letter, send it to the mortal queens, and request an audience with them at your house. And Elaine is just like, and Nesta is just like, no. <laughs> Nesta says, no, we are not letting any fairy shit go down in our house because Elaine is getting married and Feyre is like, Fe Elaine is getting married? Excuse me? She's like, yeah, Elaine is getting married in five months to this other fancy guy, like a lord or something. This guy's son, his dad is a famed fey hunter, like he's really anti-fey. So having any fey business go down would be detrimental to Elaine's future. And Elaine, remember how I said that she like doesn't really get things? All right, she's not all there. She's sort of like, actually Nesta, if what Feyre is saying is true, if we don't help her, there won't be a wedding. There won't be a mortal realm. Feyre did a lot of stuff for us growing up. Do you remember that? Why don't we do her the favor and just like let her borrow our living room, you know? Mm. Finally, Nesta begrudgingly gets on board. She dismisses all of the house staff so that there are no witnesses and Feyre does a little like and the boys come. They have glamoured themselves so they aren't as overwhelmingly beautiful, right? But they are like three giant guys. Two of them have bat wings that they can't hide. Elaine can't even hide her terror. Remember, like, mortals are very scared of fae, right? They think that they eat people and like all this stuff. So Elaine is like quaking, all right? Nesta looks ready to pounce. <laughs> Eventually she's like, come in and at least have dinner. The dinner scene is weirdly long, but the gist of it is that Nesta keeps making all of these really snappy comments about Feyre being Fey and like too good for us and like your kind and blah, 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 blah. I guess Cassian must have given her a look because she's like, what? What are you looking at? Okay. Cassian's brows rose, little amusement to be found. I'm looking at someone who let her youngest sister risk her life every day in the woods while she did nothing. Your sister died to save my people. She's willing to do so again to protect you from war. So don't expect me to sit here with my mouth shut while you sneer at her for a choice she didn't get to make and insult my people in the process. It's about to be a fight okay? Tension, running high. Elaine cuts in and is just like, you know, it was just really hard for us and like everything's kind of scary right now. Resand rolls his eyes and is just like, okay, can we just start over? Um, let's talk about what we came here for. Can we let the queens come to your house? They finally get Nesta to agree. She's like, okay, draft your little letter. You guys can stay the night, meal, over and she leaves. Because they want to keep everybody safe, like resand, something, something, security protocol, powers, fey stuff, uh, um, they have to like sleep close to each other. So Cassian and Azriel are sharing a bedroom. Resand and Feyre are sharing a bedroom. There are two beds. That comes later, my friends. Nothing funky happens. All right, they just have a little conversation. Basically, Resand is like, wow, I can't believe I got through that dinner without ripping Nesta's face off. Oh my God, she is evil. <laughs> but Feyre's like, eh, you know, like if things had happened differently, we wouldn't be here. You'd probably still be Amarantha's slave. So like, what are you gonna do? All right, she's remarkably chill about this and they also very much appreciated that Nesta might have actually almost killed Cassian. 
Um, and they probably would have paid to see that fight. But um, maybe we'll hear more about that later. So for some reason, they don't leave right away. It's taking them a very long time to write this letter. I don't know. But in the morning, Reese decides that he and Feyre should start their training. Today, they're working on her firepower, and he basically just gives her a candle and is like, light it. <laughs> they get into one of their pitter-patter fights, whatever, and she's like, you know what? I would rather do this alone. All right, Reese, you're pissing me off. Go home. Reese obliges, and then he continues to send her notes. So this is where we learn that Reese can winnow objects as well as just himself. So he keeps sending her pieces of paper with notes written on them. Oh my god, Nesta and Cassian are gonna kill each other over tea. Can I come help you? And she just writes back like, no, you're whining, blah, blah. They're shamelessly flirting, okay? Shamelessly flirting. Feyre's enjoying it so much, she keeps holding her hand out for another note. She's so distracted that she doesn't notice someone behind her until a hand covers her mouth and yanks her clean off her feet. She thrashes, she's biting, she's clawing, punching, shrieking, when a rasping voice said, stop or I'll snap your neck. I knew that voice from all of my nightmares. It was the Adder. Yes, the Adder is back. The Adder literally gets about four words out when night explodes around them. The Adder is screaming and there is Resand, and he is like binding the Adder up with something, tying him to a tree. And Reese is like, answer my questions and I'll let you go. Of course, the Adder like doesn't want to talk, but no one says no to Reese apparently. So eventually we learn that the king of highburn sent the adder to come and collect Feyre, and that an army is coming soon an endless army how fun and then once he gets all of his information resand is like next time you try and take her i kill first and ask questions later and then asriel comes out of nowhere picks up the adder and Reese turns to Feyre and he doesn't look super shaken up, which is weird. And this is where we learned once again, he knew something was gonna happen. And so he says, I was curious to see who would come snatch you the first moment you were alone. And Feyre had specifically said, bro, let me know your fucking plans, all right? He sent her to the weaver with like another little plan slipped in there. He just sent her out to train by herself in the woods as bait. To her credit, she's so angry that she does actually smack Resand, <laughs> And she looks at her hand and she's like, ooh, damn, I forgot how strong I was. Resand kind of reads her mind or reads her face, you know, because they're so connected. And he's like, yeah, you forgot. You forgot how strong you are, that you can burn and become darkness and grow claws. You forgot and you stopped fighting. And it's very clear that he's not just talking about the adder, he's talking about her being in the spring court. He's like, you gave up, and he's really pissed that she gave up, okay? So then they start fighting for real. She's like, okay, you want to see how strong I am? Come at me. And they start like throwing punches. He starts winnowing everywhere, so a lot of it is just Feyre being like, <gasps> <sighs> Eventually, Feyre figures out his pattern, jumps on him, tackles him, and she's like, just don't ever use me as bait again. And he stops laughing because he realizes that he fucked up because, yeah, Reese, you fucked up. She's like, you're not gonna use me as a pawn. You're supposed to tell me what's going on. And Reese is like, okay, fair enough. I was a dick. And he's like, all right, anyway, back to training. And she's like, no, I'm going home. Like, she actually stands up for herself. She doesn't let Reese just change the subject like he always does. And he actually does say, I'm sorry, and gives her his hand. I'm sorry, he repeated, hand outstretched. Let's eat breakfast and then go home. Valeris isn't my home, she said. I could have sworn hurt flashed in his eyes before he spirited us back to my family's house. When they do eventually make it back to Valeris, Feyre is like, all right, remember, I wanna know shit, so what the fuck happened? to the adder, because Azriel just took him and was gone. The guys are kind of like, we don't really want to show you. And Reese is like, you know what? Let's lay it all out here. Let's show them how bad the bat boys are. And so he lets her see a memory of what occurred. Azriel and Reese actually tortures the adder pretty bad, pretty bad. But we learn that Tamlin is doing something funky. He has sealed the court shut. And that just like, vibes are not good okay all the other high lords are kind of on alert they're looking at tamlin like what are you doing brother and resand is like i mean Feyre, you know better than anybody how nuts he can get when it comes to protecting things so just you know we're 
keeping an eye on the situation, but that's basically what's going on. Feyre decides to write a letter to Tamlin and being like, you know, I left by myself. Like, I wanted to leave. I wasn't kidnapped. You know, if you are trying to find me or you're going to start a war over me or something, like, chill out. I left. Let me go. And she passes it off to someone who can mail that over to Tammy. Now, the inner circle doesn't just work all day. They do actually play. So we're going to go out to dinner, have a night on the town. But before they head out, uh, Feyre, as everybody's getting ready, pops in to talk to Amren. Randomly, it comes up, just a little fun fact. Um, did you know that the night court doesn't do the tithe? Only the spring court does that? Just a fun little fact. Um, anyway, Feyre hands Amren the amulet that she gave her so that they could go to the prison safely. And Amren's kind of like, ah, you gave it back? And Feyre's like, you said you would skin me alive if I didn't. So yes, I did give it back. And Amren's like, oh, okay. And just kind of tosses it somewhere. It didn't have any magic. She was like, I just knew that you needed something to make you feel safe. So I just lied. And so the reason Resand was looking at it so funny when they were walking in is because he was like, did you steal that from Amran? Like, are you going to die? So cool. All right. Anyway, they go out to dinner out in Valeris. Um, they head to a local restaurant. Nobody seems to be afraid of Reese. Everyone looks at him with kind of like respect, maybe a little awe, but like overall, he's just like the charming mayor of a small town and everyone comes up and says hi and he kisses babies and stuff. Anyway, they sit down to dinner and the food's great and Feyre says so. Um, Feyre is basically like, I haven't had food that makes me feel like awake in a really long time. And the second she says that she feels really stupid, like food makes me feel awake. Like, what are you talking about, girl? But the owner seems to get it and she's like, oh, you know, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. And as she turns to get back to eating, she feels Rhysand's eyes on her. His face was softer, more contemplative than I'd ever seen it, his mouth slightly open. I lifted my brows. What? He gave me a cocky grin and leaned in to hear the story Moore was telling across the table. Cassian and Azrael decide that they want to go dancing tonight. Moore is always down. Moore will dance all day, every day. So they're heading out. Feyre notices some pretty interesting vibes between Azrael and Moore. Hmm. Amran goes home and Feyre and Reese don't feel like dancing. So um, they head out into the street. And as they're walking home, Feyre is like, so does Moore know that Azriel is like really in love with her? And Reese is kind of like, why don't you keep those thoughts to yourself? Um, okay, they're walking home. They continue to just gossip a little bit more about the inner circle. Nothing that we really haven't heard before. And they're about to winnow home when Feyre hears something from a group of performers outside of the restaurant. There's a little street performance going on. She pauses because it sounds familiar. My hands went slack at my side. It was a reduced version of the symphony I'd heard in a chill dungeon when I was so lost to terror and despair that I hallucinated hallucinated as this music poured into my cell and kept me from shattering. You, I breathed, not taking her eyes off of the performers. You sent that music into my cell. Why? Rhysand's voice was hoarse. Because you were breaking and I couldn't find another way to save you. So Feyre sincerely thanks him. I mean, that was really like, she was at her breaking point when that was happening, if you remember from Aquatar. And so she's like, yeah, you actually did really help me. To which Reese then begins listing all of the fucked up things that he's done. He's like, oh really? Even the stuff that I did to you with the weaver or taking you to the bone carver, letting you get taken by the adder. And Feyre's just like, you fucking ruin everything. And Reese Ann winnows them home. Okay, we are still waiting to hear back from the summer court. So Feyre pretty much spends her time lounging about and reading. This is where her and Rhysand get really into the whole note passing thing. A lot more talk about licking. The reason why I don't talk about Sarah J Mass smut scenes. I'm fine with a little steam. Sarah J Mass's vocabulary, the things that she focuses on, the way that she chooses to explain certain things are like the words that turn me off. I hate how Sarah J Mass writes her smut scenes. So they talk about licking each other and uh, we get to read that. So anyway, Feyre along with reading has also uh, started training with Cassian. She wants to know how to fight. This 
is something that you're going to see throughout the entire series, not to spoil anything, but Sarah J Mass firmly believes that physical activity and like self-defense training is the key to getting over PTSD or at least the trauma that all of the women in this <laughs> all of the women in this series suffer from. Feyre is starting on her journey of healing through throwing punches at Cassian. Asriel and Resand are also sparring close to where Cassian is teaching her. And so this is the vibe that we get from the three guys. This is how the Bat Boys are spoken about throughout the entire series. They're smoking hot, all right? And I'm gonna get this out of the way because it's cringe. They were sparring, Feyre takes a break, and she realizes that Asriel and Reese have removed their leather jackets and shirts. Their tan muscled arms were both covered in the same manner of tattoos that adorned my own hand, ink flowing across their shoulders and over their sculpted pectoral muscles. Cassian notices uh, her staring and he's like, yeah, we get those uh, for fighting, trying to talk about the tattoos, while Feyre was drinking in the rest of the image, stomach muscles glimmening with sweat in the bright sun, the bunching of their powerful thighs and the rippling strength in their backs surrounding those mighty beautiful wings. All right, they're just basically made of muscle. They're either covered in leather or they're naked. Feyre digs it, all right? Happy, happy for you, Feyre. Also, as she's looking at this scene, she suddenly is like, I wanna paint this. Like, they're so beautiful. I've gotta put paint to paper. And she realizes that she hasn't wanted to paint in a very long time. And this was her first time she's actually had a spark of inspiration, so thank you. Therese and Azriel's abs. They go back to training. Cassian happens to bring up Feyre's whole letter to Tamlin, and he kind of brings it up in a bad way, and Feyre is clearly put off by it, and Cassian, to his credit, immediately apologizes and is just like, I don't know how to talk about things, so I end up joking about them, but that was a shitty joke. They continue to punch things. As Feyre is doing the punching, every punch is for somebody else. This is for Amarantha. This is for Tamlin. All right, maybe it was the exhaustion, but I breathed. I killed them. I hadn't said the words aloud since it happened. Somehow Cassian gets replaced by Reese. It doesn't really matter, but Reese wraps his wings around Feyre and they're in this little cocoon and she feels very safe. And he's like, listen, you're gonna feel this way for the rest of your life, every single day. And I know this because I do. You can either let it rock you, you let it get you killed like it nearly did with the weaver when you had your little panic attack, or you can learn to live with it. And he also says that he's sorry he couldn't shield her from more under the mountain and that he has two kinds of nightmares. The one where himself or his friends are back at Amaranthas or the ones where I hear your neck snap and I see the light leave your eyes. Feyre accidentally lets a little bit of fire slip at that one and uh, it kind of breaks the mood and uh, she says something funny and Reese's lips twitch. There's the Feyre I adore. Oh, the summer court finally gets back to us. Who is coming along for the vacation? Resand, obviously. Feyre is coming. And then we are bringing none other than Omren. Why? Because everyone is scared of Omren. The interesting thing about the summer High Lord is that he was appointed under the mountain. Like his father died while they were under the mountain. So he's technically brand new at running his court and so we don't really know how he's gonna act so this could go many ways the next day they head to the summer court and this is where we meet tarkin who has a uh, rich brown skin white hair and eyes of crushing turquoise blue he was the one if you remember under the mountain when resand had to like crush a summer court member's brain <laughs> he was the one that like kind of looked at reese like thanks buddy for not divulging whatever secrets that guy had do you remember this okay that's the only interaction they've ever had is like the subtle nod of thanks all right Feyre like immediately likes this guy first of all because he's hot <laughs> but also because she feels this immediate sense of connection to him because he also gave her a drop of power to make her be alive again but she is still playing the game of not letting anybody know that she has powers she's just a regular girl who ditched Tamlin to go to the night court that's about it she's not supposed to be anything special Resand and Omren are still playing the part of relatively wicked people. They aren't going to be absolute monsters, but they're supposed to be like these not very nice hard asses. So along with being a regular girl, Feyre's role is to win over 
Tarkeen. Um, hopefully she can gain his trust and try and get as much information about the court as possible so that she can figure out where he would hide a book and then be able to retrieve the book, right? But luckily for her, it seems very easy to like Tarkeen and to get on his side. His court is beautiful. It's like tropical island, lots of like turquoise ocean vibes going on. Reese does however openly say that Feyre is now a member of the inner circle and that she is the emissary between the mortal realms and this is where he's able to open up and be like so let's talk about that war where we're gonna crush the mortals. <laughs> Before they start talking about Hybern though, Tarkin is like what about we talk about that other potential war on the horizon? Tamlin coming after you to get Feyre. This is where we have met two other characters. Can you see them? Eh, yeah. This is Criseida and Varian. Criseida is Tarkin's sister and Varian is kind of like Cassian, sort of. He's like a general or whatever. Interesting vibes between Varian and Amren, I must say. But Criseida sees Feyre be like, pah, a war over me. <laughs> but Criseida's like, Girl, we're talking about fey high lords. They have gone to war for less. Like, this isn't a joke. He very well could. So Tarkin and Crusada are like, we just want to know what's going on uh, so we aren't in the middle of a war zone because they're in between the spring court and the night court, right? And also Crusada is kind of not warm, all right? She's not lovely. So she's like, and we also want to know because technically, we're supposed to return runaway brides. This is, I'm not sure, but Crusada's like, what is stopping us from sending you back to the spring court or telling Tamlin that you're here? Tarkeen is like, you can shut up, Crusada. They are our guests and they deserve respect. Resand basically tells Crusada to shove it, <laughs> which Tarkeen is like, okay, okay, all right, my gratitude only goes so far. Only I'm allowed to tell my sister to shove it. To break the tension, Feyre's like, wow, no wonder immortality never gets old. You guys keep it so fresh. Everybody laughs. It's all good. And through the bond, I felt Resand's flicker of approval. So she's actually doing quite well in court settings. She is wooing people, but she's also being strong. I don't know. She's doing a good job. All right, we're proud of Feyre. <laughs> the next day we have a little meeting with Resand and Feyre, and Resand is kind of like, you know what? I'm kind of bummed. <laughs> Tarkin's a really nice guy. I feel so bad that we have to steal from him, but that doesn't stop him. We get more information that day while Feyre is chatting with him about how the summer court really likes to collect jewelry. Tarkin isn't part of that. He's just like, I don't know, my ancestors, we got a lot of jewels, got a lot of storage. And Feyre's like, oh, that's interesting. Like, my dad's a merchant. Would I be able to see some of your treasure rooms? Because she's like, if something's gonna be important, it's gonna be hidden with the treasure, right? And he's actually like, sure, why don't I give you a tour tomorrow? And this is where we all really like Tarkin, all right? Um, he suddenly switches the subject to politics and he starts talking about how he is interested in not fully getting rid of the High Lords, but kind of getting rid of the stark contrast between the High Fae and all of the Lesser Fae. He is interested in creating more equality in his court. Feyre really believes him. He doesn't, this doesn't feel like a political stunt. He really believes in what he's saying and as she's looking at him, Tarkin is like, tell me what that look means. And she says, I'm thinking it would be very easy to love you and easier to call you my friend. The feeling is mutual. Tarkin's like, ditto girl. I'm always looking for a friend. Um, across the dinner table, Resand is certainly getting handsy and comfy with Crusada, to which Feyre feels an emotion. Oh my God. Remember, she's an emotionless lady now. And she doesn't really care if he can read her emotions at this point because she feels unhappy. Not just broken, but unhappy. I realized it was an emotion rather than the unending emptiness or survival-driven terror. She's like, I'm happy I'm sad. <laughs> she spends the next seven pages thinking about how sad she is. She just goes from room to room, thinking about Resan's hands on Crusada, thinking about how they definitely went back to his room. She doesn't go to breakfast the next morning because she doesn't want to see 
either of their walks of shame. So when she finally does come out, it's time for the tour of the treasure trove. She can feel Resand, a brush of emotion up against her mental shield, but she slams it out, gives Tarkeen a big ol' smile, and Reese's little mind fingers fall silent. As we know, the whole reason that she's going on this tour of his storage shed is to hopefully do what she did in The Weaver, right? But she's looking for the next half of the book. Tarkin ends up giving her a really beautiful necklace. You know, this is for what you did under the mountain. Like, I wish I could give you something else for saving us all. And she's like, no, really, that's okay. And he's like, well, then just take it because you didn't laugh at my ideas. You know, everybody, whenever he talks about equality, everyone's like, uh-huh-huh. But she listened sincerely and he was like, I really appreciated that. Have this giant diamond necklace. And so she's like, okay, twist my arm. And he's basically like, also not gonna lie here, um, I'd really like to ally with the Night Court. He's like, I don't think that Reese fully trusts me because I don't think he fully trusts anyone, but if you could be my ally, Feyre, like if I could have a voice, a friend in the court, I'd really appreciate that. And Tarkin keeps kind of pushing her like, I know that Reese isn't that bad. Like we all saw him do X amount of things in Under the Mountain where he actually wasn't a monster. Like he's not stupid, okay? He's actually a very smart guy. And Feyre is like, okay, stop. You know, I can't tell you anything. I'm just the emissary for the mortal realms, you know? And Tarkin is like, okay, I think I've overstepped, but can I just ask you one question? And his question actually takes favor by surprise. It is, did you really leave because Tamlin locked you in that house? And she nods. And he's like, and you went to the night court because you were saved from that. And she nods again. And so Tarkin is like, all right, so... Listen, as a token of my friendship, along with that necklace, I'm not gonna tell Tamlin about you. I'm gonna make sure that the summer court keeps this little visit a secret um, because like, I really do wanna be your friend, Feyre. And Feyre's like, thanks, man. We get a quick scene where Feyre comes back, goes into her room, Resand is there, and he's like, you've been avoiding me and flirting with Tarkeen. And she's like, okay, you've been flirting with Crusader and you slept with her. And he's like, no, I didn't. Are you jealous? And she's like, yeah, I am jealous. Are you jealous? And he's like, yeah, I am jealous. And that's the end of the scene. <laughs> no, it's not the end of the scene. He obviously heard her tell Tarkeen that he would be easy to love. Honestly, that kind of hurt because I'm not easy to love. Anybody who is a member of the Night Court is gonna have a target on their back. Like, we have a lot of enemies, I guess. Maybe if you were nicer, I don't know. Anyway, but yeah, he's like, any lover I take, if I were to ever have children, like, they're always at this horrible risk. But like, the Summer Court is apparently like, Prithian's version of Switzerland. They're always pretty neutral and everybody likes them. Anybody that he brings into his family would never have to worry about that. And this is important to the fans, not to the plot. <clears throat> so I do have to read it. Reese says, he will never know what it's like to look up at the night sky and wish regarding Tarkeen. And Feyre raises her glass and says, to the people who look at stars and wish. And Rhysand picks up his glass, his gaze so piercing that I wondered why I had bothered blushing at all for Tarkeen. They clink their glasses together and he says, to the stars who listened and the dreams that are answered. So this is one of the most popular quotes in the entire series. Not my favorite, doesn't really have a ring to it, but um, to the stars who listen, all right? A few days pass and we finally find out where this damn book is. Feyre has been walking around the city eating a lot of street food, she likes it, when she notices out in the bay, there's this tower that can only really be accessed when the tide is low. So she didn't see it before. It looks like an old temple, temple ruins or something like that. She just gets a little funky feeling, all right? Feyre's senses are tingling. She brings it up at dinner. She mentions like, what is that temple? out there. And Tarkeen is immediately like, oh, it's just Bruins, you know, but this is where Feyre uses her powers to read minds. She's been practicing, right? Not only raising her shield, but breaking through others. And she checks his mind and he is super suspicious. He's like, why are they actually here? Like, why have they been hanging out in my house for so long? Should I trust them? But Feyre seems really nice. I do trust her. But why is she asking about that place? Feyre is basically like, cha-ching, bingo. And while Feyre's in there reading his thoughts, she goes one step further and changes 
his thoughts. She like basically does an inception kind of thing and whispers like, you can trust them. They're great people. You really like Feyre. And his suspicions are kind of wiped away. She does feel really bad about this, but game on, let's go. In the night, Reese flies Omren and Feyre to this temple ruin. There doesn't seem to be any guards around it or any like magic shields or anything. So Rhysand is like, all right, I'm gonna stay out here. I'm gonna keep watch, do your thing, girls. They go in and it feels, something feels off. They're essentially going through this building, Vera starts to hear a voice. She reaches this box and the box is just going, who are you, who are you, who are you? Why are you taking me, who are you? Cause she picks up the box and she's like, the book is in here, okay? And she tries to use her like drop of Tarkeen, her essence of Tarkeen to calm the book down. So she's like, don't worry little book, I'm the High Lord of Summer, I'm a friend, you can trust me. The book quieted as if that were the right answer, and I snatch the box off the pedestal. But then she hears an ancient, cruel voice hiss, Liar. And the door slams shut. They are trapped in this giant stone chamber, and remember, this is in the ocean, and all of a sudden, this thing starts filling up real fucking fast. Something turned off their magic, so Omren is useless, all of her crazy skills. Feyre can't use any of her powers. They can't even signal to Reese. They are 100% gonna drown. Eventually, the entire structure fills up and Feyre is like, I'm dead, I'm dead. She's not having a panic attack. She's just being realistic. She's like, yeah, this, this is the end. Omren is still fighting because Omren doesn't give up, but eventually both of them are completely under the water. Her lungs are literally seizing when the door to the structure was ripped away. That is when she sees three beautiful ethereal faces of the water wraiths. This is where it all comes back to you. Remember in the beginning of this book with the tithe, Feyre helped the water wraiths and the water wraiths were like, we owe you a debt. They are paying up and not a moment too soon. They drag Omren and Feyre to the cove. Resand is like, oh my god, what the fuck happened? I just spent all of this time running around blasting all of the guards because you sounded some crazy alarm. And so now I had to like knock all these people on their asses. Let's get out of here. And he just zoops them back to the night court. The rest of the inner circle is waiting at House of the Wind and they're all like, what the hell happened? Like, <laughs> Feyre and Amran are like dripping wet, still gasping for air. And Rhysand is like, yeah, I'd honestly like to know too, because he doesn't know either. Feyre tells them about the water wraiths and Amran is like, I don't know what fucking luck you are running on, girlfriend, but like, damn, keep it up. And then Amran just starts laughing and then Feyre just starts laughing and they are both hysterical. Like, you know when something scary happens and you just can't stop laughing? They are losing their minds. Rhysand is not laughing. <laughs> and when they finally stop, Resand is like, no more fun time, guys. Open the book. So they get the book open and everyone is a little bit shocked because it is in a language that hasn't been used in like thousands and thousands of years. Amren, lucky for them, knows how to read it. This is where plot makes me scratch my head a little bit because Resand lets us know that he assumed the book would be in some kind of ancient language, which is why we brought Amren. And secondly, I didn't want to get your hopes up, but like, I'm hoping that in that book is also a spell to send you home, Amren, which makes us wonder, remember how Feyre was like, he taught me to read so that I could read the book when I stole it? Like that doesn't... <sighs> You can't think about the plot too deeply. Omren literally just like scurries off. She goes to her little apartment in the city and starts reading her book. Everybody just kind of disperses because that was a hell of a day. Eventually, Feyre finds Rhysand up in his little like watchtower area. He's sitting there clearly just like moody, 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 moody boy, all right? He's having a little drink and he, when he sees Feyre, kind of like shoves this weird little box towards her. She opens it and it is blood rubies, which Resand explains is basically the summer court's way of saying, you fucking stole from us and now we want your head. They're on the summer court's most wanted list. But you know what? 
he's been on people's shit lists before. That's not why he's moody. He's moody because the only reason that Tarkeen was alerted so quickly about what's missing is because when he was in his rush to get the guards when that alarm was going off, he just knocked them out. He didn't erase their memories and he was like, I was sloppy. We can't be sloppy in this line of work. Like he just takes his failures really hard. Our little Reese is a perfectionist, we will find. This is where we see Sarah J Mass turn the tables. You know how for this entire series, the boys, whoever it may be, have been shamelessly flirting with Feyre to get her mind off of dark thoughts, right? Feyre is gonna take a little page out of their book and do the same for Reese, she starts talking about how, cause she's like technically on the line, like Reese's line of credit. So she can just like buy anything and be like, put it on Reese's tab. She's like, so if I like went to a lingerie shop and like maybe if I bought Tarkeen, maybe if I like sent him some of my lingerie, I don't know. She's trying to like first make him angry by talking about Tarkeen and then just go straight for turning him on by being like, you can help me pick it out, blah, blah, blah. As they are like inching closer and closer to each other, talking about shopping for lingerie together, Azriel pops in. <laughs> Feyre is like, all right, I'm gonna head out. And as she's walking down the stairs, she like keeps daydreaming about this lingerie shopping activity. And it starts to get real, real steamy when she slams into the wall and she realizes that she wasn't daydreaming. Reese sent that vision to her and he, she can hear him cackling from the top of the stairs. So she reinforces her shields. So he stops sending her, literally sending her dirty thoughts. Um, and then she takes a very cold bath. But she sees him later that night when they go back to the townhouse. Everybody else stays at the House of the Wind. Just Reese and Feyre go to the townhouse in the city and she wakes up and she is just surrounded by this inky blackness and she hears like something is very very wrong and so she realizes that it's Reese and she runs to him. He's having a horrific nightmare as well and so this is her turn to wake him up and comfort him and basically she realizes that he sleeps separate from the inner circle so that they don't see this part of him and usually apparently it's contained to his room but this was an extra bad one. Does he sleep naked? You're wondering. Yes he does. Feyre is trying her best not to look but anyway we uh we get to see Reese be really vulnerable and Feyre does say that in a way she finds that her heart is kind of healing. We get a lot of scenes now of Feyre training with Cassian. She also has meetings with Reese. Um, not only to control her powers, but to learn about each High Lord that she got her powers from. So she's doing kind of like a history politics lesson every day as well. Reese is the High Lord. We don't know what he does at these meetings, but he has a lot of meetings. Um, and so whenever he's gone, they are continuing to pass their flirty notes back to each other. At one point, Feyre is like, at least you make up for your shameless flirting by being one hell of a High Lord. And then he never answers until he comes home that night and he just walks in and he's like, so, I'm one hell of a high lord, you say? <laughs> it's, they're healing, okay? They're healing together, it's great. She also has such a handle on her powers that whenever he pisses her off, she can throw a bucket of water out of nowhere onto him. And um, he like shakes like a dog and, gets her wet and she screams and it's just like a lot of those, it's a super cut, all right? The cute moment is over though because the queens have finally fucking answered their letter. So we have to go back to the human realm to meet the six mortal queens. They get to Nesta and Elaine's house and they're sitting in the living room and the mortal queens just like pop out of nowhere because they can winnow. Also, there's only five of them. The sixth queen is sick. They range in ages, but we have the very old one and the very young one do most of the talking. The oldest one is basically like, listen, you've got one hour. Make it snappy. Convince us. And Reese is basically like, a war is coming. We need your help. And she's like, yeah, we know. We've been preparing for this war for years. And Nesta and Elaine are like, we don't see any war preparations. Like, we live on the front line. 
you know like we live on the border so if you're preparing for a war we would see it like what are you talking about and remember the mortal queens are from the continent even though they do technically rule over that little sliver of land that Nesta and Elaine live on and they're just like yeah that would cost way too many resources to guard where you guys live so we're just helping out the continent and Elaine is like okay Nesta is like there are children who live here there are good people who live here like how dare you not protect us Feyre starts begging them for the other half of the book. You know, she explains why they need it and everything. The mortal queens say something snappy back. Reese says something snappy to the mortal queens for saying something to Feyre. Basically, the whole situation just dissolves. And the oldest mortal queen is like, okay, we want proof, you know? We hear that you aren't the mean, nasty man that you play the act of being all the time, Mr. reese Can you prove to us that you are a man worthy of being trusted. Give us something to work with, okay? There was only one way, only one way to show them and prove it to them. Valeris. My very bones cried out at the thought of revealing that gem to these spiders. And Reese is like, I'll send word soon. We need time to prepare the proof that you need. And then the mortal queens just zap away. And even Elaine, <laughs> Nice little Elaine is just like, I hope they burn in hell. <laughs> they waste no time getting back to the house to plan. And basically we have two options of info proof that we could give the queen. First one is Valeris, as we've talked about, which Feyre does not like. And Amran is like, well, we could show them Miriam. And this is where we get a story that is going to come into play in the next book. So I'm going to tell you it really fast, try and remember it, okay? Remember Jurian, who was the eyeball ring of Amarantha. She killed him because he tricked her sister into loving him and then just used her for information and then killed her and then Amarantha killed him, right? Okay, so before that happened, Jurian was this like human soldier man and he was in love with this woman named Miriam. Miriam was a half fae woman. This evil fairy queen is getting married to a fae prince named Prince Draken. Apparently, this is like a normal thing, but as a wedding gift, the queen, his fiance, gifts him Miriam basically as a sex slave. And Draken is, to his credit, freaked out by this. He doesn't like that. So he sets her free. Miriam ends up meeting Jurian. They fall in love, okay? Then during the war, I mean, the war complicates everything in general. War sucks, all right? Jurian ends up allying with Prince Draken's fey army as well. Remember, there are fey that fought for the humans. He goes off and is doing the whole seducing Amarantha's sister thing in the name of war, all right? He's still in love with Miriam. But because he's gone, Miriam is like a, basically like a nurse, I guess, and she ends up nursing Prince Draken, meeting him again, and they fall in love and run off together. Everyone believes that they died, but what really happened is that Reese and Moore and some of their friends helped Miriam and Draken and his army run away and they live kind of in like another Valeris, basically. Like they're hidden somewhere. And Omran is like, we could show the queens Miriam and Miriam would stand up for you and be like, yeah, Reese saved my life and kept my secret for hundreds of years and blah, 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 blah. But Reese is like, we're not gonna use Miriam. We're gonna sacrifice my entire city. And so he's really set on telling them about Valeris. But he's like, I'm not gonna bring them physically to Valeris, hell no. So I'm gonna use this little object that we have. And it's basically this object, it's like a crystal ball kind of thing, is made of a certain magic that can't lie. And so whatever you see in there is the truth. And he's like, we can bring this to them, show them Valeris, and then they'll know it's true and it's good proof. And more immediately her face falls. She's like, mm -hmm. Ugh. Why? Because that item is at the court of nightmares. <sighs> so now I'm going to do a little info dump with you. So we are going to the court of nightmares. Cassian and Feyre are going to be there as distractions while Azriel goes in and steals the orb. Why can't he just take the orb if Reese is in charge? No one knows. 
no one knows. Number one, Reese sort of doesn't want Favor to come because he's gonna have to act like the baddest baddie. You've only just started to look at me like I'm not a monster. And also, it's underground. Basically, Amarantha designed under the mountain to look exactly like the Court of Nightmares. So Feyre hears this and she kind of waits for panic to set in and it doesn't. And so she's like, boop, guess, guess we can go. All right. And then she asks, you know, why did Moore look so freaked out? Like when he mentioned Court of Nightmares and going there, she looked visibly ill. And this is where we get a little history about Moore. Once she became like of age, her family gave her to one of the Autumn King's son to be their wife. And as we have heard from Lucian, that family sucks. But before she could be handed off to her husband that she hates, probably, um, she ended up getting herself to the Illyrian war camp and she had Cassian do her a little favor, which was deflowering her. It wasn't a romantic thing. It was just she needed to not be pure anymore because she knew that would fuck up the whole marriage thing. And sure enough, the Autumn Court was like, we do not want this used female. And she gets sent back to her family. Her family beats her and then nails a note to her body, drops her on the border of the Autumn Court, and is basically like, here, deal with her as you will. We don't want her anymore. So, and this story weirdly like really inspires Feyre because Moore has been through like evil shit, but she's like one of the warmest, kindest people that Feyre has met thus far. Um, so Feyre's like, you know, if Moore can heal from all of that shit, so can I. So to the court we go. This chapter has got to be the most drawn chapter when it comes to fan art. So I am sure you have seen this and uh, it's a it's a steamy one. So how am I going to tiptoe around this scene? Okay, um, Resand has prepped Feyre on not only the role that he will have to play, but the role that Feyre will have to play. Feyre has to play the role of being the like sex crazed woman who has fallen in love with Resand and like they started some kind of torrid love affair under the mountain and that's why she left Tamlin is the story that the Court of Nightmares knows. And so as they're flying to the Court of Nightmares, she can feel him being really tense. Like he really doesn't want Feyre to see him put on this act. And so she decides to make him less tense. And so just while they're flying, she whispers into his ear like, I heard a rumor that the size of Illyrian males' wingspan might mean that the size of something else is different. And he kind of like chuckles. And then she's like, and I heard that Asriel's wings are the biggest. I make my life so wet. Like it's just, uh, but it works. He feels a little bit better. Thank you, Feyre, for the dick jokes. This is when Feyre reaches out to touch his wings and Reese is like, ooh, don't do that. Because um, their wings are really sensitive and that's gonna come up later. <laughs> they are continuing this sexy talk when all of a sudden they get shot down by arrows. There are just arrows flying everywhere. Cassian and Azriel have their like magic shields going up and stuff. Resand is like, Cassian, take Feyre back to the palace and then we're gonna go follow the people who were shooting the arrows. And Feyre's like, no, take me with you and then I can sense maybe who sent the arrows, right? And so finally Resand is like, okay, we've got an hour before we're supposed to be at Court of Nightmares, so let's figure this the fuck out. Um. Figure it the fuck out, they did not. They didn't find anything and they just head to the Court of Nightmares. I don't know, I don't know, man. Long story short, because this is a long story. This is a long ass scene. They get to the Court of Nightmares. Everybody is scared of Reese. Reese is like a very not nice guy. He can cut your head off at any point. Like if he gets mad, he can just zap you. Like he's got that reputation, right? So they walk in, everybody's a little traumatized because it looks like under the mountain, but they head to the throne room. What is Feyre wearing? <laughs> Feyre is wearing next to nothing. She is supposed to look like, like I said, little like sex crazed woman. All right, and so she takes a seat 
Henri Sand's lap. We have a very, very long drawn out lap dance scene. At first it's like they're putting on a show, right? They're supposed to look the part, but then they get a little too into it and it just becomes a fan art worthy scene, I suppose. And they're talking to each other constantly as this is happening, like whispering in each other's ears. And they're like, yeah, this is a great distraction. We're doing so good. We're such good actors. This is great. Yeah, and it's just natural for our bodies to react this way. That's that's why we're both turned on like well look at us oh god um anyway Moore's father makes the mistake of saying something about Feyre being like a whore or something Reese breaks his arms and stuff <laughs> they get what they came there for they got the little orb of truth and then they fly back home and Feyre is unable to forget the feeling of literally every part of Rhysand's body on hers and she doesn't know how she feels about that and where does it put her. Knee deep in trouble seems like a good place to start. Reese winnows them out of the Court of Nightmares, but where they land, it's just Reese and Feyre. Cassian and Azrael and more are nowhere to be seen. And Reese says, I'm sorry, with a hoarse voice, and his hands are shaking because he's still really pissed about what Moore's dad said to Feyre. And he, like, was clearly so angry that he broke his arms and was, like, screaming at him, like, apologize, you know? So he's, like, riled up, but he's also really embarrassed that he lost control and he said i shouldn't have let you go i shouldn't have let you seen that part of us of me and pharaoh's like you coached me through it like i knew what i was getting myself into tonight like stop trying to protect me i said i wanted to be there and i was there it's fine and the scene should have ended there but resand is like i just couldn't stop my instincts and pharaoh is like what did you say because that sure sounds like Tamlin. Every time that Tamlin was overprotecting her, Tamlin was like, it's just my protective instincts. Like, I can't help it. That's just who I am. I want to protect you. And Resand is saying the same thing. Like, it's just my instincts. I have to protect you. Like, I would hurt anybody who ever tried to hurt you. Vera is not please. She's like, well, you should have prepared yourself better, okay? And Reese says, I will kill anyone who harms you. Go ahead. You can despise me for it. And then he's like, and by the way, like, stop comparing me to Tamlin, all right? I didn't lock you up. He continues, you think I don't know how these stories get written? I'm the Dark Lord who stole away the Bride of Spring. I'm the demon and a nightmare. He's the Golden Prince, the hero who gets to keep you as his reward of not dying of stupidity and arrogance. And Feyre's like, okay, cute. What about my story? Okay, I'm the main character of Akatar Reese. What about my story? What about what I want? And so Rhysand is like, okay, Feyre, what do you want? And she doesn't answer and he's kind of like, <laughs> thought so? Like, maybe you should figure that out sometime soon, okay? And that makes Feyre snap. So she's like, you know, I don't know what I want, but at least I don't hide behind a mask. You can have your mask to quote unquote, save your people, but what about the other mask, Reese? What about letting your friends see your real face? Or maybe it's easier not to, because what if you did let someone in? And what if they saw everything and they still walked away? And who could blame them? Who would want to bother with that sort of mess? And he flinched. The most powerful High Lord in history flinched. And Feyre realizes that she went in way too hard, way too deep, but without a word, they winnow back to Valeris. So we're back at House of the Wind without talking to each other. Reese goes and talks to the inner circle. Feyre goes out to the moonlight garden and she just combs over the last couple seconds and she sort of has this realization that the stuff that she said to Reese as it always is, is more about her than it was about him. And she's also kind of coming to terms with the fact that she was jealous and that she wants to give this thing a try. Whatever this is, even if it's just a physical thing, she's ready to tell Reese, like, let's do this thing, but he never comes out to the garden. Reese doesn't show up for breakfast, for lunch. Um, Feyre is bored, so she heads over to Amran's house. Amran is still, like, never leaving her apartment because she's trying to read the book. Turns out, even though Amran recognizes the language of the book, she's not fluent. It's very old. Um, so she's not only working on, like, reading it, but she's trying to actively translate it, so it's taken her a while, okay? And when Feyre walks in, Amran's like, oh, Hey, it's the reason that Rhysand bit my head off this morning. <laughs> Rhysand's in a mood, but he's off doing 
something or other. He's trying to figure out who shot those arrows at them. And he wants them to all get ready because they're heading to the Illyrian war camps tomorrow. And Feyre's like, why not today? The inner circle never wastes any time. And Omrin tells us that something special is happening tonight. Something called Starfall. So you might be wondering, what is Starfall? If you are excited for another fairy sex ritual, sorry to disappoint you. It is not. It is a festival that is celebrated in all the courts, but it's extra special in the night court, but we can't tell you why until the scene. But this is the first Starfall that they've had together in 50 years because he was under the mountain for 50 years. So it's a really important thing. Favor's about to leave the house when Omran is just like, by the way, when Rhysand came back, he was a ghost. So like, thank you for making my friend be alive again, basically. You know, we're really lucky to have him and Feyre's like, yeah, well, he thinks he's the villain of this story. But then she says, but I forgot to tell him, I said quietly opening the door, that the villain is usually the person who locks up the maiden and throws away the key. I shrugged. He was the one who let me out. When she gets home, she continues to write him notes, but he doesn't take any of them. She just like has them in her hand and he never grabs them. So she starts to get a little bit angry and she finally is like, you know, is this some kind of punishment? Like, do we not get second chances, you hateful coward? And oops, that's the one that he decided to read. <laughs> we get some party time. Starfall has started in Valeris. Cassian and more are super excited because any excuse to dance, these two. <laughs> They're there. Resand does finally show up and he basically pulls Feyre aside and is like, listen, like that wasn't a punishment. I just needed to like digest those things that you said, you know, I needed some time. And Feyre is like, we are dancing, okay? Not the time for this conversation, Resand. Also, just the way that this is written, Resand steps up behind me snorting as he said into my ear, look up. So if you just imagine Resand just popping up behind Feyre in her ear and just goes like, <sighs> Anyway, we learn what Starfall is. If you can picture a giant meteor shower, there are these spirits or something. They're not stars, but there are these ancient things that like migrate across the sky. And of course, in the night court, it's really easy to see them and it's beautiful and it's stunning. So everybody just continues dancing. Feyre is like, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And remember, Rhysand is the most beautiful man that she's ever seen in her entire life. And Valeris is the most beautiful place that she's ever seen in her entire life. Sarah J Maas really likes most beautiful. <laughs> Feyre catches Rhysand watching the inner circle dance and he's like kind of sad and everything. You know, this is like their first time really being together so joyously for 50 years and then tomorrow they have to leave to go to an Illyrian war camp because war is on the horizon. So it's a bittersweet moment. Resand sort of grabs Feyre and is like, I know a place <laughs> with a better view. So we go up to Resand's little watchtower again and Feyre immediately starts apologizing to Resand about what she said and Reese is like, honestly, it was true what you said and that's why it hurt so I just kind of needed some time to let that sink in and he also is like actually Amarantha knew how important Starfall was to the night court every year for Starfall she would like be extra evil and abusive to him he is like really kind of suffering from that and he doesn't want to tell his friends and ruin their night and Feyre's like honestly knowing what I know of the inner circle they would love to help you carry that burden. They would be honored to listen to you and support you and do whatever you need. And Rhysand is like, oh, like how you let other people help you with your troubles? And they're both kind of like, yeah. They have a moment, they're getting closer face to face. Feyre's fingers graze Rhysand's and then Feyre gets slapped in the face. <laughs> By what you're asking? By one of those weird star spirits. I don't know how off course it got or how high this watchtower is, but yeah, a giant star thing slams into her. She lets out this like startled cry and Resand just starts like he doubles over and is just howling with laughter. Whatever it is, it's basically like a little glitter bomb and she's just covered in incandescent star spirit. <laughs> Feyre shoves Reese to get him to stop laughing at her. He stumbles and then he gets hit in the face with one of these star spirits. <laughs> he let out a curse and I laughed, the sound rasping out of me. Not a chuckle or a snort, but a cackling laugh. And Feyre realizes that she's doing a lot of things she hasn't done in a while. Number one, she's laughing 
very hard. Number two, she has wanted to paint. Like, again, Asriel and Rhysand's abs inspired her, but many other things now recently, she's just like seeing potential paintings and he's like drawing a star in the glitter on her hand and all this stuff. It's cute. The tension is thick and Feyre can't stand it. So she cuts it with, you owe me some of your thoughts because remember when she got to house of the wind and she just like let off all of this stuff about like like i think i only love tamlin because he was like right place right time you know that whole speech she gave that was because resand asked her what she was thinking and he was like i'll trade you a thought for a thought you know and she ended up listing a bunch of things she was thinking about and then resand never told her what he was thinking. So now we get to dig into Reese's brain. What's he thinking about? His first thought is that he didn't come back to the house because he thought Pharaoh was still gonna yell at him. <laughs> and number two, he regrets kissing her under the mountain when he was trying to like hide Tamlin and her little moment. He's like, sorry about that. You know, I didn't make it pleasant for you. I really regret doing that. The tension is just right back there, all right? Reese talking about kissing Feyre hello and Feyre is just like running out of ways to avoid this tension so she's just like do you want to dance <laughs> they have their cute little picture-esque moment um they are alone in the watchtower dancing covered in glitter this is when Feyre kind of realizes that Rhysand is my friend and not only that I think he's like my best friend <laughs> and she is sort of like I'm down to do this physical thing I'm down for a friends with benefits thing I can't say the word l-o-v-e um but let's give this a go and this is when Rhysand kind of leans in and is like you know I'm really glad I met you Feyre and they go down to the main square and dance the night away with the inner circle everyone says they've never seen Rhysand so happy um the next day they go down for breakfast and everybody is extremely hungover um they're getting ready to go to the war camp and this is where Feyre's inner saboteur comes back to join us. She apparently had a really nice night and then this little voice in her head is like, excuse me, weren't you just about to marry Tamlin? Didn't Tamlin do so many nice things for your family? Isn't he the reason why they're in the house that they're in? That your dad has a job again? How dare you be thinking about Bat Boy? Remember when Pharaoh was getting married to Tamlin, she kept thinking that she was an evil, dirty murderer that can't marry this golden boy. And now she's thinking that she is this traitor tramp. <laughs> who is rebounding too fast. Whatever voice is in Feyre's head is just not nice to her. She has not learned the art of self-love yet. <sighs> they get to the Illyrian war camp where we learn that this is not a cute place to be a woman. Rhysand and the Bat Boys are making an effort to try and force the like leaders of the community to let the girls train and so they get there and the girls are still cleaning the dishes and they're like what the fuck is this all right feminist king apparently the girls are allowed to train only after they do chores and resand is like bup, bup, bup. cassian Azrael, go fix this so they go and stand up for women the bros of the Illyrian camp start to size up Feyre, start to say weird shit and resand is basically like growl she's mine don't touch her if you do i will let her kill you all right she's tough so back off and then they head into where they will be staying and Feyre is shaken because all she can hear is resand saying she's mine Reese and Feyre are flying off somewhere to train. Feyre's never done asking questions, so while she's practicing her magic, Reesand is like, all right, you practice, I'll answer your questions, go. Her question is, how does he know Tamlin? Royal people tend to hang out with each other, I don't know. So she understands that they have a relationship, but she doesn't understand how that happened and why. And this is pretty important, so here we go. Tamlin is younger than Rhysand, but like they're immortal, so whatever. They ended up hanging out and they got pretty close because their fathers were both pieces of shit and they like fighting, I don't know. So he ended up training Tamlin, actually teaching Tamlin some like Illyrian warrior stuff. They were buddies, okay? And as Tamlin is growing into his powers, he surpasses his dad, the High Lord. And so the High Lord just like hates his son, I guess. In order to punish Tamlin, he goes after Rhysand because he thinks that like maybe Rhysand had some kind of influence on his power. I don't know. 
I don't know why he does this, but the High Lord goes to where Rhysand's mother and sister are, the location of which the High Lord would only know because Tamlin told him. It's supposed to be a secret. Tamlin's dad and his brothers go find Rhysand's mom and sister and kill them and cut their heads off and put them in boxes and send them down river to be discovered by an Illyrian war camp. Resand and his dad are obviously not happy about this so they go to the spring court and just start killing everybody they're supposed to only kill Tamlin's dad and brothers because that would be direct revenge for you know they were the ones who killed his family but his dad is like so enraged that he killed Tamlin's mother as well who like wasn't involved in this. Rhysand had talked to him ahead of time like they weren't gonna kill Tamlin's mom. Rhysand's dad doesn't listen and when Rhysand finds out he's standing there like what the fuck and at that very moment Tamlin opens his door, smells all this blood, can smell that his mother is dead and because his dad died he just like absorbs all of the High Lord power so he's a super powerful dude now. Before Rhysand can say anything, Tamlin kills Rhysand's dad. So now everybody's dead. They are both, they have both lost every single family member together because of their weird little friendship. And then they both in the same second just became High Lords. And so now they're like super duper powerful and Rhysand just leaves. I should also mention Tamlin's dad, after killing Rhysand's sister and mother, took their wings and hangs them up in the study where Feyre has been studying. <laughs> this whole time. This is kind of complicated. Feyre doesn't know what to think exactly because it's interesting that Tamlin didn't tell her this because if he was trying to turn her against Rhysand, he very easily could have told her, hey, he killed my entire family. He killed my mom, you know, but he never mentioned it. He was always like, oh, you know, Rhysand, blah, 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 kind of thing. So she's feeling like all types of ways and she asks Rhysand like, why didn't you tell me sooner? And he's like, well, I didn't want you to think that I was turning you against him. So they kind of like both did the same thing. It's weird. I don't know how it happens, but this scene takes a weird sexy turn. Feyre out of nowhere is suddenly like, I want to paint you. And Rhysand is like, nude would be best. And then we just get like several pages of Feyre not being able to even look at Rhysand without having like dirty, dirty thoughts. I don't know. Anyway, they continue training. They are in this beautiful mountainscape. There's a babbling brook and the water is running. There's like a waterfall. So it's no wonder that Feyre didn't hear them coming. She turns. Arrows are knocked and ready, pointed right at them. Four guards stand at the tree line from the spring court. And in the middle of them, is Lucian. Lucian is back, baby, and he is like, girl, where have you been? I have been hunting for you for like two months. Feyre does not take kindly to the word hunting, and she's like, I left, my good dude. Did you not get my letter? I said, leave me alone. And he's just like, girl, listen, Tamlin realized his mistake. He wasn't himself. You know, I gotta take you back and we'll explain everything. It'll be fine. Just come with us. And Feyre's like, I'm not going home with you. That stopped being my home when you locked me in it. It became a cage. Lucian lunges for her and this is where we find out that Feyre knows how to winnow. She just goes poof and now she's standing next to Reese. and Reese is like, didn't the lady of the autumn court teach you that when a woman says no, it means no? Feminist king. And Lucian fully believes that Rhysand has done something to Feyre's mind to make her want to stay with them, you know, because he still thinks the night court is evil, right? So he's like, what did you do? You know, Feyre, like, we're not your enemies. Everybody goes through hard times, but like, you just gave up on him. And Feyre is like, don't tell me who gave up, buddy. You were my friend and you picked him. You picked obeying him. And even when you saw what his orders and his rules did to me, even when you saw me wasting away day by day, I begged you so many times to help me and you left me alone or you shoved me into a room with the ant or you told me to stick it out. And Lucian is like, and is the night court any better? Feyre can't tell him about Valeris, right? She can't be like, actually, it's really nice. So she's just like, you know, if you spend long enough time in the darkness, you find that the darkness isn't that bad. And Feyre has gotten so heated that you know what just happened? Our girl sprouted wings. Yes, she maybe can't join the Bat Boys just yet, but she has wings now. And Lucian is like, 
wings out, talons out. She's like, tell Tamlin if he sends anyone else into these lands, I will hunt each and every one of them down and I will demonstrate exactly what the darkness has taught me. Lucian seems really sad because of this, uh, because he's like, he's Feyre's friend, you know, but they leave. And now my dear friends, we have reached the part of the story where the two main characters find themselves at an inn that has no vacancy except for one small room with one tiny bed. When they walk in, Resand is like, I asked her, I asked her for two beds. He's got his hands up. And of course, you know, it's cold, baby, all right? It's really chilly and she doesn't want to risk using her firepower. There's no fireplace. So the only thing they can do, Feyre says, is use body heat. To wipe that look that just got on Rhysand's face, she's like, my sisters and I used to share a bed all the time, like, I'm used to it. Don't get any ideas, <laughs> you know? Rhysand runs down to get them food, and when he comes back, he's like, if you had gone with Lucian, I would have let you. You know, it's always your choice, but if Lucian had taken you, boy, I would have ripped him to shreds. And this is where Feyre says something that actually kind of surprises her as well, is that if Lucian had gone after Reese, she would have shot Lucian. Mm-hmm. They start doing their little thought trading exercise again, you know, tell me a thought for your thought. All right, I'm just, I'm just gonna read it. I'm just gonna read it, okay? Reese says, I'm thinking that I look at you and I feel like I'm dying, like I can't breathe. I want you <laughs> I want you so badly, I can't concentrate half the time I'm around you. And this room is too small for me to properly bed you, especially with the wings. I'm sorry, suddenly it's very hot in this room and Farah is like, actually, ditto, my friend, feeling is mutual. I don't really have control over when my wings pop out, but I can imagine doing the deed with two pairs of wings. Um, probably not fun. And she's like, even if that makes me a traitorous, lying piece of trash. And Resand is like, hey girl, don't talk about my friend Farah like that. They go to sleep, they need body heat, they're snuggling, it gets a little bit more snuggly, and Resand is basically like, you're sending me really mixed signals here, like what exactly do you want? And Farah weighs all these options, She's not ready to say what she actually wants because again, she thinks that she's like a traitor and a tramp. I want a distraction. I want fun. His body gets tense behind me and I wonder if somehow he didn't see the lie for what it was and if he thought that all I wanted was just a distraction. And he just says, okay, you get your steam, okay? And maybe it was the wine or the aftermath of the pleasure he drunk from me, but I didn't have a single nightmare. They wake up the next day and Feyre is honestly ready to just confess and be like, actually, you know what? I don't want a distraction. I want friends with benefits more than friends with benefits. Like, I don't really fully know, but like, I, I'm taking this more seriously than I'm letting on. But instead of just outright saying it, she decides to ask Reese, like, so why did you keep our bargain? To get Reese to say it first, you know, like, oh, I kept the bargain because I wanted to see you because I love you, la la. That's not what she gets, all right? He says, I did it to piss off Amarantha and Tamlin and to save my people because I needed to keep you alive. That's how I saved you is with this bond. And she's like, okay, cool, 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 cool. They spend the rest of the day flying around for places where Feyre can test her power because they think that the people who sent the arrows are like chasing them. So that's why they're constantly moving around. And also we needed a scene at the inn, right? Rhysand is holding her and it seems like he's about to tell her something important. He seems like really distracted, really tense, when all of a sudden he just roars in pain and they get struck by arrows again and he actually gets hit this time. So they're like high in the air and they're just falling, falling, falling. Feyre is like, win out, Reese, you can win out. And he, for some reason, like his magic isn't working, something in the arrows. So they are just about to crash into the ground. And he keeps getting hit by arrows, by the way. He's got them in his wings, in his legs, everywhere. And so once they get closer to the ground, Reese just straight up tosses Feyre into the trees. <laughs> and Feyre's okay, little scratched up, but she's okay. And obviously first order of business, we gotta go find Reese. And what we do know about Feyre is that even before she was high Fey, she's a damn good hunter. She knows that this is probably gonna be a trap. Like they're, the people who sent the arrows probably already found Reese and are gonna use them to like find Feyre, whatever. But she's like, 
I got this, please. Hunting is my specialty. She does end up finding Resand. He is in a cave where he's being heavily guarded by Highburn guards, okay? And he's chained up. Like, again, he doesn't have any power. Um, and he's also physically injured. He's also being whipped. His back looks like a, quote, ravaged slab of meat. Feyre sees red. She is, like, hungry for blood. She starts winnowing everywhere with her little knife. She's just like, winnow, strike, winnow, strike. Kills them all, okay? The blood on my hands feels different from what it felt like under the mountain. This blood I savored. She gets Reese. He's lost a lot of blood. The chains are also made of something that they can't touch. Not iron, but whatever it is, it really stings Feyre to get him off, but eventually she frees him and they run off into the night. She also doesn't have enough strength to winnow like two people, so they're trying to get just as far as they physically can. When they finally stop, Feyre tries to get the arrows out of Rhysand. They're obviously very painful, so Feyre is trying to distract him as she's like yanking him out, right? So she tells him a little story about how when she was 17, they had a little money left over and Elaine used it to buy Feyre some paint, and Feyre just started painting the whole house, um, and they had like this dresser drawer for the girls and each sister had a drawer and so for Elaine she painted all of these like beautiful flowers and everything for Nesta she covered it with flames <laughs> and Rhysand asks what did you paint I painted the night sky he stilled I painted the stars and the moon and clouds and just endless endless dark sky I never knew why I rarely went outside at night usually I was so tired from hunting I just wanted to sleep but I wonder if a part of me knew what was waiting for me, that I would never be a grower of things or someone who burned like fire, that I would be quiet and enduring like night. I wonder if I was looking for this place, looking for you all. She gets all of the arrows out of Resand, and he, just before he passes out, says, I was looking for you too. The next morning, Resand looks even worse because you know what? These arrows are covered in poison. Yes, indeed. So Feyre's like, who are we gonna call? The cereal, yes, the person who knows everything and who she can catch with extreme ease. So off she goes into the woods, sets up a little trap, and within seconds, boom, the cereal is here. And boy, oh boy, <laughs> do they have stuff to tell us. This is juicy. You guys are going to want to pay attention to this, okay? First of all, she asks, listen, we got poisonous arrows. Uh, what do I do? And the cereal is just like, actually, just give him some of your blood. <laughs> because we learn more about this actually in the next book, but the High Lord of the Dawn Court has healing powers. And because Feyre has a drop of power from every High Lord, her blood contains that healing magic as well. So he's like, you know, couple drops, swish it around in his mouth, he'll be fine. And if you wish to speed your mate's healing, in addition to your blood, a pink flowered weed sprouts by the river. Make him chew it. What did you say? If you wish to... The cereal paused. You didn't know? Say it, I gritted out. The High Lord of the Night Court is your mate. I wasn't entirely sure I was breathing. Not lover, not husband, but more than that. A bond so deep, so permanent, that it was honored over all others. The words slipped out of me, low and twisted. Does he know? Yes. For a long while? Yes. Reese is gonna get it. Oh my god, Feyre is... Whoo, whoo. Feyre is pissed. She is like, okay, bye, Cereal. This has been enlightening. And she runs back to her dying mate. She goes back to the cave. Resand is exhausted, looks really pitiful, all right, gives him the whole like blood and weed situation. The wound is healing. I think Reese is like, how are you or something? And Feyre's like, we ask the questions! Oh my god. She's like, how long have you known that I'm your mate? And he's like, oh shit. Reese hands stilled, the entire world stilled, he swallowed. How long? have you known? Basically, he suspected it for a while, and then he kind of like low-key fell in love with her under the mountain, and then when he picked up that knife to kill Amarantha, that's when he was like, ooh, buddy, like, this is more than a crush. And then when we stood on that balcony, remember when Resand said like, thanks for setting us free, and then as he's starting to go away, he's like, 
That is the moment where the mating bond snapped into place. It's full force, just hitting him like a train, and he's just like, oh shit. That was six months ago. And Feyre's like, and you had any plans on telling me about this? And he's like, honestly, I've been thinking about it for the past six months, Feyre. You're kind of freaking me out. This is why I kind of didn't want to tell you. Look at your reaction. And also, I was thinking about telling you yesterday while we were flying, and that's why I was so distracted that I didn't see those people coming up behind us with the arrows, and that's why I'm laying here poisoned having you yell at me, okay? So like, just go easy on me, Feyre. And the reason why Brisan kind of hesitated yesterday is because Feyre said she wanted a distraction not a mate. But Feyre's like, no, 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 no. All right, listen, bud, you told me you weren't going to keep any secrets from me anymore. All right, what do you think this is? All right, pretty big fucking secret. You're healed enough to winnow us back, so let's go home, buddy. All right, shut up. I saw the pain and sorrow in his eyes, saw and didn't care. Not as my heart ached so viciously that I realized somehow it had been repaired in the past few months, repaired by him, and now it hurt again. So basically, he fixed her heart and then just broke it right then and there. Oof. Resand. She saw nothing but agony in his face as he pulled himself up and winnowed them back to the Illyrian war camp. When they land in the war camp, Resand literally collapses because he's not strong enough yet. He's been poisoned. So he's like on the ground and he's like, Feyre. And Feyre runs off, finds more, and she's like, listen, don't ask questions, but I need you to take me somewhere where nobody can find me. Don't tell Resand where I am. Let's go. And more is just like, Got it, girl. Resand is still on the ground, like, bleh. Moore takes her to this, like, special house that they have way up in the mountains. It's another one of those things where people can't winnow in and out unless they have certain permissions and stuff like that. And Feyre's like, and I have permission to be here because I'm his mate. And Moore's like, did uh, you find out or did he tell you? <laughs> Feyre is basically like, just don't tell him where I am. And Moore is like, you know, for what it's worth, Feyre, he really wanted to tell you, like it was killing him, you know? And Fair is just like, don't really care right now. Thank you. Adios, chica. Moore says, I'll be back in three days to, I guess, bring her like food and supplies. And then she left the cottage before I could say anything else. I was alone, no one around for miles. I stood in the silent cabin and stared at nothing. Part three house of mist we are gonna finish this book today guys buckle up feyre spends her three days in this house all by herself she takes a lot of baths and then she starts painting she actually paints this really nice mural of the whole inner circle and then more as promised comes back after three days and she they kind of have a heart to heart you know talking about the inner circle as a whole. Moore just kind of says like, would it be that bad to be a part of our family, Feyre? Like, why are you fighting this so much? And Feyre's just like, no, it wouldn't be that bad. And she has her answer. She knows what she's gotta do. But Feyre's not ready to leave yet, so I think Moore sleeps over or something, and during this time, she spends another like five days there, she has this really vivid vision, I would say, of her entire future with Reese. It seems really nice and really happy, and she's like, suddenly feels this fire in her that's like, I would fight to my dying breath to have that, you know, drama. She's like very settled in this decision. So five days later when she hears someone at the door, she's like, all right, Moore, perfect timing. I'm ready to go back. Let's go. And she opens the door and Moore is not standing at the threshold. It's Resand. You betcha it's Resand. His cheeks were tinged pink with the cold. His dark hair is ruffled and he honestly looks freezing. His wings are tucked in tight. He's shivering. And it goes without saying that he would fly away if Feyre told him to. But he just stood there waiting. She just kind of looks at him, holds the door open, steps aside, lets him in. I could have sworn I felt a pulse of knee wobbling relief through the bond. So she's basically like, all right, buddy, we've got a lot to talk about. Why don't you have a seat? I'll heat us up some soup. And he's like, soup. <laughs> and Feyre's like, no, 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 soup? Why'd you say it like that? She's like, listen, I don't know how this whole thing works. So like, if you're gonna be like, soup 
you gotta explain use more words okay turns out when someone with the mating bond makes their partner food and serves it to them that's like a confirmation of the bond it's some like call back to old times you know but the tradition is still something that's really strong and so reese is clearly moved by this and farah considers it and she's like okay you talk i'll heat up this soup and then we'll see like once it's ready to eat we'll see if i pass you this soup all right it's all about the soup guys all about the soup so here's Rhysand's life story okay he was old enough that he fought in the war he was still young something something happened he got captured by amarantha and they put spikes in his wings so that he probably would never be able to fly again and so because of this whole thing even though eventually he got free and they won the war he is like consumed with this obsession of killing amarantha for what she did so when the war ended and amarantha is still there she's the spy but she's secretly trying to like win over all the high lords you remember this and she throws this party when she stole all the high lord's power so resand wasn't originally gonna go but he went because he thought that was his chance to finally kill amaranth because of that he didn't tell cassian or asriel that he was going so he went to this party without any backup it was just him and like knowing asriel i'm sure he would have noticed something was up before resand drank the poison but resand was so obsessed with killing amaranth that he didn't even notice his drink was funky and he lost his powers as we know he used that last moment of his power to shield valeris and his friends and everything like that and then he immediately went into being under the mountain with amarantha after a decade i stopped expecting to see my friends i forgot what their faces looked like and i stopped hoping but then three years ago i began to have these dreams at first they were clips like i was looking through someone else's eyes they were brief and i thought nothing of them until one of the images was a hand holding a brush painting flowers on a table and something about them it was like they were a reminder that there was some peace out there in the world and they went on for years until a year ago i jolted awake from a dream a dream that was clearer and brighter like the fog had been wiped away and this is when he realizes he's been dreaming of a human woman i wonder who suddenly his dreams become clearer and he just knows in his gut he's like this human's in fairy now this human's in Prithian, oh my god. And also, he was dreaming of her dreaming, and she was having a nightmare about the Bogue, so she, he was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, she's in Prithian. And in another one of her dreams, because now he's just like in her dreams all the time, he notices that the fields are becoming, like they're getting ready for Colin Mai in the spring court. And he's like, okay, I gotta go. He told Amarantha that he wanted to go to the spring court to do a little bit of spying, but really he was going to see this dream girl, right? And when he found her, he was so overcome with the desire to slaughter the guys who were bothering her that he just started speaking to her without even thinking. There you are, I've been looking for you. His first words to me. Not a lie at all. I had the vague feeling of the world slipping out from under my feet. He could tell pretty immediately that she had no idea who he was, what he was. This was a one-sided thing. She was not seeing him in her dreams. Um, and so he kind of backed off and was like, okay, buddy, you've overstepped. This was already too much. He ends up going after those guys who were bothering her and like twisting their brains and bringing them to Amarantha as like a gift, basically like, look, I found something while I was there to like throw Amarantha off any suspicion, okay? So she just like th killed those guys, okay? And then when he came to that dinner at Tamlin's house, saw Feyre and that's why Tamlin sent her home, that was all kind of on purpose. He went to Tamlin's house not knowing that Feyre was with Tamlin, but the second he saw her, that's when he was like, I've got to get you out because if she didn't break the curse, Amarantha would kill her. So he, that's why he was like super duper evil to scare Tamlin, ouch, to scare Tamlin into sending her home, okay? But of course, she didn't listen. She came back, freed them all. Yay, Feyre. Okay, but that's what went down. If you're wondering about Claire, killing claire let's just clear up everything the girl that they killed because he told amarantha that claire was Feyre. Feyre was claire you know the thing he basically broke into her mind and so while they were torturing her he turned off her pain receptors so she didn't feel anything and he told her when to scream to make it seem believable and then when they fully killed her he did it quick and painlessly so hmm. and he thought you know okay we're done curse didn't get lifted 
we're all screwed. And he was in the throne room when the adder dragged Feyre in. And I have never known such horror as I did when I watched you make that bargain. And then I learned your name and hearing you say it was like an answer to a question I've been asking for 500 years. Then he tells her the whole story of like, I slowly fell even more in love with you for each trial. And then, you know, when I picked up the knife, I knew you were my mate. And then your neck snapped and I was just distraught. Feyre at this point in the story is openly sobbing into the soup. I thought you died, he whispered, and this beautiful, wonderful thing that had come into my life, it was gone. And in my desperation, I clung to that bond, not the bargain. The bargain was nothing. I grabbed the bond between us and I tugged. So that little golden string that she saw wasn't the bargain like she thought it was. It was the mate bond, okay? It was Resand who convinced all of the High Lords to give them a drop of their power uh, to give to keep Feyre alive and he says like honestly I think they were too stunned to even question me <laughs> so they just did it and then actually that night on the balcony when he did his little like <laughs> stumble he was considering telling her then but again she like had Tamlin it was very clear that like she did all of the stuff under the mountain for her love of Tamlin so he was kind of chickening out and then the mating bond like snapped in it hit me so strong that I panicked I landed at the night court as more was waiting for me and I was so frantic so unhinged that I told her everything. I hadn't seen her in 50 years and my first words to her was, she's my mate. And he basically spent three months trying to get over the fact that his mate was sleeping with another man. And then he felt her on her wedding day just freaking the fuck out and he was like, well, I can't not. <laughs> so he went and got her and because it was still like under the guise of this bargain, he knew he would have to send her back. And it killed me, not just because you were my mate, but because I knew I was in love with you the moment that I picked up that knife to kill Amarantha. Ah, uh, Feyre turns around with the boiling soup ladles it slowly into a bowl. I stopped before him, staring down, and I said, you love me? Rhysand nodded. I set the bowl down before him, then eat. That confession, by the way, was 12 pages long, just so you know, monologue. Anyway, he's eating soup now. <laughs> so yeah, Feyre finally admits to herself that Reese is a pretty cool guy and she is honored, honored to be his mate. Not gonna lie, I teared up the first time I read it. I'm a sucker for like lovey-dovey confessions, so I'm not gonna read any of it, lest my voice wobble. But yeah, it's cute, and then you get your goddamn steam. Remember when Reese said he would like to bed her where he could fully extend his wings or something like that? Mm -hmm. What better place than an abandoned cabin in the mountains? Um, so I'm not going to read that to you, my friend. After that chapter. Resand is like, by the way, tomorrow um, we have to go back to your family's house because the queens are coming. And Feyre's like, you're telling me that now? And he's like, I'm, I was busy. I mean, I I wanted the soup. Remember what, what, everything that just, I, it, it, it. I did forget though that the uh, wings out nasty that they did um, there was also paint everywhere because Feyre was painting. That's talked about a lot. The details, Sarah J Mass, the soup, the paint. I just, the, the steam, I can't, I can't, Sarah. Anyway, we also, after the whole like, you couldn't have told me earlier thing, we get even more smut because apparently when the bond clicks, they just go into a frenzy and all they can do is make me sick. <laughs> Some couples don't leave the house for a week. Reese is like, I'd like to believe I have more restraint than the average male, but please be patient with me. I'm a little on edge. Feyre is also like, by the way, I don't want a baby right now. And he's like, got it, tonic, okay. They go back to the Illyrian camp and Cassian does what he does best. He is obnoxious and he says something to Reese that makes him go feral and they go off to fight each other. It's because Cassian saw this like kind of crazed look in Rhysand's eyes because of the mating bond, you know? And he knew that Reese needed to blow off some steam before meeting the queens. So he was like, I will be your punching bag. And uh, they fight viciously. More shows up. And she's like, they'll be at it for a while. Why don't you come inside? Welcome to the family. And I thought those might've been the most beautiful words I've ever heard. Most beautiful strikes again. <laughs> so we're back in the human realms. This time only two queens come, the oldest and the youngest. The oldest one talks the most. The youngest one is quiet, but she seems really amused by everything. She's kind of like a Lucian character who just sits there and is like, oldest queen she's not not nice we don't like her but anyway they did what they came here to do they show the queens valeris and Farah is just like everything about this feels wrong i ugh. and the queens are honestly shocked by this they're like oh damn 
wow, that is the most beautiful place I've ever seen. The oldest queen is like, we will consider giving you the other half of the book now that we know this. And everybody's like, we don't have time for you to consider. Like, we need this now. And she's like, you know, not my problem. We also get to see what that letter Resand wrote to the queens originally was. Remember, this was like way back when they first came here and the adder took favorite, you know, this whole time. Resand wrote a letter requesting the queens to come, right? What did that letter say, by the way? I write to you not as a high lord, but as a male in love with a woman who was once human. And he's basically like, I need your help because I want one day for my love to be able to like visit her family and stuff. And Favor's listening and she's like, oh my God, how cute. Like this wasn't a letter proposing allyship. It was a love letter. Ugh. But the eldest queen has like a black hole for a heart. And so she's not moved by anything that's going on. She like saw Valeris, got a love letter from Resand. Nothing's touching this girl, okay? She's basically like, I still don't really trust you. And Nesta, blows a gasket. Give them the book, you evil witch. I've crunched the numbers, and if you want to evacuate us, you need an armada. We're stranded here, please don't leave us. She has tears of rage. Cassian crosses the room to stand next to her and says, I fought on these battlefields 500 years ago beside the humans, and I will stand on this battlefield again, Nesta, to protect this house and your people. I can think of no better way to end my existence than to defend those who need it most. And Cassian wipes a tear from her cheek. And still the queens aren't moved. We've got Resan's love confession. We've got Cassian being like, take my life. Nothing. God. And they leave. The queens just leave. And you might be thinking, Resan, where's that fire? Where's that evil high lord spirit you've got? You could have stopped them. You could have held them hostage. You could have demanded something. Why aren't you working harder at this? Because his eyes are trained on the chair that the youngest queen sat upon. And what is sitting there? The other half of the book. Yes, indeed, the youngest queen did us a solid, all right? She somehow stole the book and just left it there for them. She also left a note. I read your letter about the woman you love and I believe you. I believe in peace. If anyone asks you, you stole this during the meeting, do not trust the others. The sixth queen was not ill. Remember how only five of them showed up to the first meeting? But anyway, Let's get to work. Amren, who has still, my God, still not left her apartment, has the second half of the book. And so there's nothing that they can do until she finishes translating this. So they're just kind of hanging out. Resand goes off to do a thing. So it's really just Cassian and Azrael and Feyre hanging out when the unthinkable happens. Valeris is attacked 5,000 goddamn years and Resand just handed it over to them. Yeah, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of creatures that look like the adder come down from the sky. This is when I wish I hadn't picked the slug woman. <laughs> so please don't picture slug women. Thousands upon thousands of them attacking the city. But the first creature that they kill isn't a citizen of Valeris. It is the youngest queen. They impale her on a light post, the metal going straight through her sternum and that's the end of our hero queen. Sorry, lady. Cassian and Azriel jump into action. Cassian tells her to get the fuck home, okay? And of course, Feyre doesn't listen. Um, so she actually runs directly to the rainbow, the artist quarter, and tries to defend them. And then she uses that beautiful brain and is like, I've got so much power. What can I do? And she looks at the river water power. All that time that she spent flirtatiously throwing water at Resand, it all comes to play here. She like crafts wolves out of water and like sends them off to fight the adder. I don't know. Her wolves, instead of like biting, they like swallow them and drown them. Pretty gruesome. It's pretty gnarly. And sometimes she just kind of sprays the adder with water and then turns it to ice and they just like fall to the ground and die. All right, our girl's creative. We love it. This entire time, by the way, Resand is trying to get into her mental shield and is like, where are you? Where are you? Like, get back in the house, blah, blah, blah. And Feyre just shuts him out completely. Puts her phone on do not disturb. She cannot be found. And she goes and kills them all. Specifically, she does find the Adder. She's got some of those poison arrows that we love so much. And she plunges them into the Adder. And she's using every power. She's like, here, have a taste of water. Here, have a taste of fire, right? So he's burning, he's falling. Then she just like breaks out the dagger. And she's like, this one's for Reese. This one's for... She lets the Adder slam into the cobblestones. And she winnows away at the very last second. Reese finally finds her. And they literally just cry a lot. 
they get the wards back up around Valeris, but that took pretty much all of Cassian and Azrael's power. So they're just laying there like physically and emotionally exhausted. And they're talking about like, well, the cat is out of the bag. Everybody knows about Valeris. Like the mortal queens know about it. I'm sure it's just a matter of time before all the high lords know. So what are we gonna do? And you know what they're gonna do? retaliate. If you're wondering how did they get through Valeris's legendary wards and stuff, they used the cauldron. So we know that Highburn has the cauldron now, confirmed, but luckily that very same day, Omrin finally cracked the code. So now we know how to get rid of the cauldron. The problem is, in order to cast the spell, you need to be touching the cauldron. So where do we have to go? straight into Highburn's lair because of course somehow they also know where he keeps his cauldron. Apparently he's like not very secretive about it. Asriel's like, yeah, I honestly was kind of insulted by how easy it was. So the plan is Cassian, Asriel, Moor, and Feyre are gonna go and do the thing. And who can't come? Resand. Remember how they kept getting shot by arrows? It turns out that Highburn has in fact set this like tracking thing on Resand's magic. And so anytime he's anywhere, Highburn knows and like they would know that he's coming. Okay. Resand is like, Are you asking me to stay outside while my mate goes in there? And they're basically like, Dude, it's the only way, yeah. <laughs> also, Feyre has a very interesting question. She's like, what happens if we just put the two parts of the book together? Cause Omrin is like keeping them on separate ends of the room, okay? Omrin's basically like, if you put them together, it will create this giant boom, which is just bad in general, cause maybe it's a bomb. And also it will alert Highburn. But not only that, it will probably awaken some things that have been asleep for a long time and should remain asleep. Feyre's like, gotcha, okay not putting the books together. <laughs> and Resand, of course, is like, Feyre, it's your choice. If you want to go, go. And Feyre's like, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna go. We're gonna stop this thing, okay? Before they leave, though, they have this cute little moment where Resand explains a little something that we've always been curious about. Remember how he sent her to get that ring from the weaver. Let's hear him talk about it, shall we? As he told us, his mother gave him the ring, but then she took it back and she gave it to the weaver. She told me that if I were to marry or mate, the female would either have to be smart or strong enough to get it back. And if she wasn't either of those things, she wouldn't survive the marriage. So when he sent her to the weaver, it was to test her powers, to test that she could get over her panic, and also to retrieve her wedding ring. <laughs> anyway, it's a very cute and touching scene, except you know that when somebody proposes right before sending their loved one off to possible death, Sarah, Sarah, a lot of things are going to happen really quickly, so I'm going to try my best to go over them. Honestly, even however many times I've read this, it's still a little foggy what happens, but we have the gang, Cassian, Azriel, Moore, Feyre. They get into the palace pretty easily. Go down to the dungeon or basement or wherever he's keeping the cauldron, they find it. Feyre has a slip of paper that Omrin has written the spell on and she just approaches the cauldron. She's also holding the books. And remember how when she was at the summer court, the books were kind of talking to her? It continues and he's like, Listen, I know we got off on the wrong foot. We'd be like drowning you and stuff, but um, why don't you put us together? Just put, you know, one, two. Put them together, you know? Kind of like, why don't you? Something weird happens. Feyre essentially goes into a trance. Again, this is really foggy. Puts the books together and she touches the cauldron and all of a sudden the world kind of goes like, whomp. And now she has a bloody nose because the power was too much for her. And then she's being like ripped away from the cauldron. Like somebody grabs her. It's funky. Whatever happens, something's weird. Weirder still is who comes into the room. Enter Jurian in the flesh. He is no longer just a ring made out of an eyeball. They have resurrected him. But before he can really even say anything, who else shows up? Resand. He basically just couldn't deal. He couldn't sit there waiting and worrying back at the house. So he just winnows in, realizes that something is going horribly wrong. He goes to winnow Feyre out. He's like, mission over. And then he can't winnow. 
mm -mm. Jurian kind of chuckles and he's like, man, the trap wasn't even that hard to set. Like, I'm honestly really sad that you fell for it, man. It would have been a lot more fun if we could do this again sometime, but like, first strike. Rhysand's out. Basically, the second he winnowed in, the king put up some kind of weird shield, and now nobody can get out and nobody can use their powers. rut -row. Speaking of the king, Hello, he comes in. But before we can even get really properly introduced to him, Jurian just like picks up a random bow and arrow and shoots Azrael through the chest. What the hell? They are poison arrows. It's the same poison that Reese had. For some reason, the King of Highburn can like control it. He can be like, listen, I can speed up this poison. I can slow it down. I can make it move straight to your heart, Azrael. So like all of you guys had better listen to what I have to say and cooperate, and maybe, maybe I won't kill your little spy master. The King of Highburn is like, follow me! And they all head to the throne room. When they get there, it's empty, and the King of Highburn says to no one in particular, I've kept my end of the bargain, now it's time for yours. And who walks out of the shadows? Yep, they did the damn thing. Feyre is standing there like, to thinking that she can like unsee them. No, it is true. It is not a mirage. Tamlin allied with Highburn to get her back. Piece of shit. More specifically, Tamlin has agreed to let the king of Highburn's forces enter Prithian through the spring court. Lucian refuses to look at Feyre. He's super ashamed, clearly not down, not excited about this. And Tamlin straight up calls Feyre like a dog. He's like, here, Feyre, come on, let's go. Time to go home. And Feyre's like, I'm not going anywhere with you. You'll see differently, my dear, the king said, when I complete my final part of the bargain. What is the final part of the bargain? Breaking the bond, breaking their bargain. Tamlin, and remember, Lucian kind of did too. They believe that Rhysand must have done something to Feyre's brain to make her think that she wants to be with the night court instead of the spring court. Like it couldn't have been Tamlin's actions. Definitely has to do with Rhysand. So he's like, bring Feyre back to me and get rid of this weird bargain. Basically he wants the tattoo gone is his thing. Feyre starts pleading, starts explaining. She's like, I wrote you a letter. I came here on my free will. Like, please don't do this. And Rhysand is just standing there really fucking still, barely breathing barely moving. Why? If he moves, Tamlin could very easily scent that they are mates because as we know, Sarah J Mass loves to talk about smells. And so yeah, once you are mated, um, people can smell that on you, your scents intertwine. And so Rhysand is just trying to stand downwind, you know, like, please don't smell me, please don't smell me. And this is where Feyre starts doing her thinking under pressure thing, when she realizes that the spell that Highburn placed around the castle that's getting rid of their powers, he had to have used the cauldron to do that. And Feyre is like, well, the cauldron was made, I was made, I don't know, you know? So she basically tries to talk to the magic and undo the spell herself. Again, it's a little, little loose, this part of the plot, but she is just standing there like coaxing the magic to listen to her instead of Highburn, right? She looks back at Reese, Cassian, and Moore, who are all holding a dying Asriel in between them, and she says, I'll come with you if you leave them alone. Let them go and I'll come with you. And Tamlin is pissed at that, so he just lunges for Feyre, but he misses because Feyre winnowed. Yeah, she lifted the spell. Tamlin stumbles, Reese manages to punch him in the face, which is cool, but that little movement made Tamlin go <sighs> Tamlin fully believes that this, like even the mating bond is due to like some mind control shit. So he's really pissed and Feyre is like, just how could you? Like, do you know what he's going to try to do with the cauldron? And the king is like, well, actually, I'd love to show you a little demonstration. And he brings out four of the mortal queens, but also he brings out two other figures and Feyre feels her heart jump out of her body because it is Nesta and Elaine. Long story short, Jurian had originally gone to the mortal queens really early and told them what they were gonna do. And he basically convinced them that like the night court is evil, blah, 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 because people tend to believe the side that they hear first. 
And so they were never going to believe Resand, even with all of the proof that he gave them. Jurian and Hybern also as a bonus, they were like, we're gonna give you eternal life. You're gonna get some immortality, my ladies. And they're not incredibly stupid. So they were like, before we let you dip us in this cauldron shit, we wanna see it work. Okay, enter Nesta and Elaine. Hibern talked to Eanth. He posed the question as like, who would Feyre most like to see immortal? Like, wouldn't she love her sisters to live with her for eternity? Um, he also promised Eanth that when he takes over, he would get rid of the High Lords and make the High Priestesses queens, right? She's always trying to climb that ladder, okay? To be fair, even Tamlin looks really sick at everything that just occurred. They grab Elaine and start dragging her towards the cauldron, start firing it up when all hell breaks loose. There's just this flash of light. There is this power that is evil and unending. Resand shields Feyre. Cassian tries to shield Asriel, but he, his wings just get shredded um, he's like bleeding profusely, can barely move. Moore takes this opportunity to use a knife and try and kill Highburn, but as she's lunging, she hears Azriel screaming, because remember, Highburn can still control the poison, and he's like, take one step closer to me, girly, and I'll make this poison go straight to his heart, you know? Nobody can do anything. Everyone is just frozen. Right before they fully submerge Elaine, who is screaming and sobbing, um, Lucian and Tamlin are like, this was not part of our deal. Like, you need to stop. This is going way too far. The king is just like, well, I don't care. Lucian goes fucking feral. He's like, that's enough. And he tries to save Elaine, um, but he gets knocked on his ass. Then the king wraps both him and Tamlin up in these like powerful bonds and in Elaine goes. She gets dipped in. Eventually, she comes out. Nesta roars because the girl who comes out has pale, shiny skin. Elaine is high fae, but that's not enough to convince the queens. No, no, we gotta put Nesta in too. Don't worry. Cassian is trying his best to save Nesta, but he's literally like half of his body has been blown away. So he like can barely move, but he's like doing the crawl to the cauldron. Mm. Nesta doesn't make it easy for them. She goes in with a full fight. Eventually she is pushed under, but teeth bared, Nesta pointed one finger to the King of Highburn. A curse, a damning, a promise. When they put Nesta in, something is clearly like wrong. Nesta comes out something different, as if the cauldron in making her had been forced to give more than it wanted, as if Nesta had fought even after she went under and decided that if she was to be dragged into hell, she was taking the cauldron with her. She has got a shit ton of power. First order of business, push Lucian far the fuck away from Elaine. Lucian has like managed to get himself over towards Elaine and is trying to comfort her. Nesta is still weeping, still raging, still inspecting Elaine when Lucian's hand went slack. His voice broke as he whispered to Elaine, you are my mate. Nesta hears this and is like, bitch, no, you are not. And she gets really angry, basically is seconds away from tearing Lucian apart. When the king is like, bup, 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 show's not over. We gotta make some queens now. Let's go for a dip. But before we do that, Feyre is gonna put on a little show for us. She's basically looking at all of this chaos and thinking like, I did this, like I fucked this up. I didn't read the spell fast enough. I put the books together, blah, blah, blah. She's like, how can I get us out of this mess? And that's when she just explodes with light. She collapses on the ground and all of a sudden she's like looking around. She's like, Tamlin? Oh my God. And she turns to Reese and is like, what did you do to me? Pretending that she got out of whatever mind control Reese had. Reese, to his credit, plays along pretty much immediately. He puts his hand in his pockets and he's like, how'd you get out? She runs over to Tamlin and is like, oh my God, take me home. Meanwhile, she's talking to Reese in their minds and is like, I just blew the wards out. So remember, there were like two parts to his little trap. It was First, they couldn't use their powers, but then there was this bigger issue of he created wards so that they couldn't get out. So Feyre had broken the you can use your powers within the castle thing, but then she just, with that big explosion, that was her getting rid of all of the wards, right? So she's like, listen, you can get out. So like grab my sisters and get the fuck out. As this is happening, 
Feyre realizes that they're on a time crunch. So like she might have convinced Tamlin, but any second now, Highburn is going to notice that the wards are off. So she needs to specifically distract the King of Highburn. How does she do that? She turns to him and is like, break the bond. <gasps> Resand went as still as death. I know you can free me from it, said Feyre, so release me. The king points at Feyre, does some kind of weird magic thing, and Feyre just starts screaming in pain. Resand joins her. She feels like she's dying, and then there's this crack, and the world cleaved as the bond snapped. She faints from the pain, and when she wakes up, her tattoo is no longer. In that moment of chaos, Moore grabs Nesta and Elaine and everybody winnows away. They're all gone. Brisan, Cassie, and Azrael Moore, all gone. Feyre is just standing there with Highburn, with Jurian, the Queens, Tamlin, and Lucian. Lucian, speak of the devil, isn't really buying Feyre's act because he's looking at all this go down and he's kind of like, you don't look really upset that the night court just stole your sisters, all right? And Feyre's just kind of like, we'll get them back, it's okay, you know? Because he's really concerned because his mate just got taken to the night court, right? Shouldn't you be a lot more worried about this? And Feyre's kind of just like, we'll talk about it later, Lucy. Like, drop it, drop it. This is when the King of Highburn suddenly is like, where is it? And Feyre's like, yeah, hmm? And he's like, the book of breathings, the book that you brought here. What I forgot to mention to you <laughs> is when Resand first winnowed in, like the very first second, he took the book out of Feyre's hands and put it in his pocket. Questionable. How big are this man's pockets? All right, how small is the book? Confusing, but basically Resand has it. And so when he winnowed away, he took the book, which is how you control the cauldron, right? The king is furious and he just like winnows off to find this book. I don't know, he just pieces out. The next chapter is actually in Resand's POV and they get back to the night court. They're bringing Elaine and Nesta to an undisclosed location. Azriel needs a healer immediately, so does Cassian. Two of the three Bat Boys are in need of serious care and Resand is just panicked and he ends up telling Auburn everything, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And he like at this point can barely talk. Like he's just like frantic. So Moore starts talking to Auburn and she's like, and he broke the bond. And Auburn's like, no, that's impossible. You can't break the bond and Moore's like no he did and Omran's like no that's impossible and Resand is like yeah you're right it is impossible what indeed yeah the king of Highburn might have broken that little bargain that they made you know like one week every month blah blah blah, blah. but he couldn't break the mate bond are you kidding me so yeah they're still good and they can still communicate with their minds right so Feyre is going to go to the spring court with tamlin but she's going to help them spy that wasn't the original plan but like they've got to make do with what has happened so she's a spy now okay more and amran are like what the fuck she's your mate not your spy you asshole and resand says quietly she is my mate and my spy, and she is the High Lady of the Night Court. What? said Moore. If they had removed her other glove that she was wearing to Highburn's castle, they would have seen a second tattoo on her right hand. Last night, they crept out, found a priestess, and basically swore her in as a High Lady of the Night Court. She is not a consort, not a wife. She is the high lady, my equal in every way. And Moore is like, okay, you mean to tell me that my high lady is now living with the enemy and we can't protect her? Reese is like, your high lady made a sacrifice for her court and we will move when the time is right. Omran's like, so what do we do until then? Until then, we go to war. The last chapter is in Favor's point of view. They winnow back to the spring court, which is lovely again. They've rebuilt everything. It's nice. But Favor's like, ooh, man, it is small. She was a city girl and now she came back to like this hick town, but she's still playing it up. She's like, I, I thought I'd never see you again, blah, blah, blah. But she's not going to let Tamlin completely off the hook. She's basically like, all right, I'm back. Let's continue that conversation we had before I left. I don't want any guards anymore. I want more freedom. I want this, 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 this. She's like, I have so much to tell you. I can help you. I want to get my sisters back. 
So you have to tell me everything too. I'm gonna be in every meeting. I'm gonna know shit. Tamlin is like, okay, we'll start over. I was wrong. The second you left, I realized I'm so sorry. Oh my God. And he's like, but you're home now. And she's like, yes, forever. And she turns and she sees Lucian looking straight at her as if he'd seen through every lie, as if he knew that they had let a fox into the chicken coop and that he could do nothing, not unless he never wanted to see his mate again. I gave Lucian a sweet, sleepy smile. So our game began, and so Tamlin willingly let the High Lady of the Night Court into the heart of his territory. <sighs> That is the end of A Court of Mist and Fury. Thank you guys so much. There is one book left. I consider Aquatar a trilogy. You can try and convince me in the comments if you want me to do Court of Silver Flames, but man, in my mind, we have one more book left in this series. Um, I'm almost finished writing the script, so hopefully that will get to you at least by next month. Once again, thank you to Squarespace. There will be a link down below if you would like to go to squarespace.com slash Carrie Can Read to get 10% off of your first website or domain. Um, thank you for making this video possible. And yes, I will see you guys next time. I've got to turn the air conditioner on because I'm dying here, but um, love you always. I always look forward to your comments. I will see you later. All right, bye.